Welcome to the Proud to be Profane podcast, where we're not afraid to drop a few F-bombs, make some dirty jokes, or pee on the all-seeing pyramid of Illuminati enlightenment. And now, here's your host, Mr. Michael Joseph. Welcome to the Proud to be Profane podcast. All right, we have episode number five coming at you. Last time with David Whitehead, we had more of a Mars-Saturn vibe to it. Today is more of a Venusian vibe, and perhaps a lunar vibe, but also Neptune. And Neptune is all about the oneness, and there's different kinds of oneness. There's the fake globalist bullshit oneness that they're trying to push us towards every single fucking moment of our lives. And then there's real oneness that is a lot harder to find. And it takes some work, and it takes some dealing with people's flaws and differences. But if you can get past that in a constructive way, you can find an untapped ocean of connectivity. That sounds pretty new agey, but whatever. So this Neptunian vibe thing we're talking about here is going to be in relation to electronic dance music. And now we'll throw in Uranus with that because there is an element of technology and breaking free of borders and innovation, thinking outside the box. Now those all sound like great, awesome things, right? But as we know about the controlling system, they use great, awesome words and ideas. And instead of making them actually great and awesome, they fool people into thinking they're great and awesome while enslaving you in the process. That's just how these guys work. I'm pretty sure you all know that, but Today we're going to be talking about how that goes on in the electronic dance music community and how it relates to technology, Silicon Valley, transhumanism, and Elon Musk. Doesn't that sound kind of like a superhero name? Doesn't that sound kind of made up? You know, like, in a world filled with darkness, there's one man who'll bring the light. Elon Musk. Something like that. I feel like it could be in a movie. I don't know, maybe he's got an actor background we don't know about. Seems like many of these characters out on the world stage tend to have that. Or maybe he's 100% legit and SpaceX is real and all these rocket landings and launches are 100% genuine. I'll leave that for you to decide, but we're going to get weird and wild and off-planet with Emily Moyer, because that's the show she's coming from. And her being a Cancer, we want to make her feel welcome, at home here, secure. So let's do just that with Miss Emily Moyer. All right, Emily, welcome to the Proud to be Profane show. Um, It's good to have you here. Thank you very much for coming on. And to start off, we'll just get right into the questions. Um, Just uh, would you like to give a little bit of a background as to how your general awakening process began? and how you became aware of hidden agendas and what people would typically call, you know, New World Order conspiracy or research. And feel free to share as much or as little as you'd like. Uh, Just go to town. (laughs) Sure. Just before we get into that, I just want to say um, thank you very much for having me. And um, I'm really glad to have this opportunity. I've taken a chance to look into some of your work. A lot of people have been mentioning you to me for a long time, especially my friend Alex. And so I'm glad that I kind of had to do it in order to get ready for this. And I have to say, I'm, I'm really impressed and I'm actually honored to be one of the first guests on your new podcast. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you. And <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. So the awakening. So I think in my, I've, I've had probably many different awakenings on various levels throughout my life. But I would say in general, like in comparison to most people that I've observed around me, On a certain level, I've always been awake because from the time I was very little, I've always had that thought or that idea that there's what you think is going on and then there's what's really going on and they're not the same thing. Um, And so I think having that perspective, like maybe set me up in a position to be more primed for awakening or to, you know, not be, uh, you know, not to be so sheep like as many other people. Um, So we'll start with that. And then I'd say that probably like, a first real kind of a, a certain kind of awakening happened when I was 16 and I broke my neck. And that's like a, a lot, like a kind of a life changing thing for someone at that young of an age. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, it turned out to be, you know, not the most serious kind of broken neck you can have. I obviously wasn't paralyzed or anything, but I was a gymnast and interrupted my gymnastics career. And I did end up going back. Um, but that, that kind of event sort of gave me a new perspective on, um, I just started observing things a little bit differently. I think I became a little bit more self-aware and also more self-conscious, but, um, I'd say from that point was when things started to look a little funny to me. Um, I know a lot of people, um, that at least a lot of people that I know that are really awake or, or super like high information crowd or whatever have had head or spinal cord injuries. Um, and so I don't know what that role that possibly played in it, but so there was that. And then I do remember um, on 9-11, 2001, like just, I remember I was walking into my bedroom and the TV was on and I looked at it out of the corner of my eye and I saw what was happening and I just wasn't that interested. It, like I, in terms of like, not that it wasn't interesting, but I was like, oh, I'm not gonna, this, like, something in me was like, this isn't real, don't pay attention. And I'm not saying that it wasn't real, but you understand what I'm saying. like. Something in me said, like, there's something funny about this. And I just didn't pay much attention to it other than the way it sort of affected my immediate life. And the only way it really did that was in the way it related to dance music in that um, I was living in Austin at the time. We had a very active dance music scene that I was very involved in, and it got completely shut down um, after 9-11. Like, went from being, like, a thriving scene to couldn't do an event anymore. You couldn't get, you could, no place would, like, rent you the space to do it. Cops were all over you like flies on shit. It was it was interesting how those two were connected. So that was another one because by that point, dance music had become a really important part of my life. And suddenly that was under attack. And I started looking at what was going on with the government um, a little bit and like just how, but not on any sort of like super conspiratorial level, just like yeah, Joe Biden's an asshole because he's passing uh, laws that are like anti-rave act kind of stuff. And, you know, I just became aware of like, okay, like there's some like, there's funny strings between my life and like what's going on with this like government nonsense and whatever. And okay. So there was that awareness. And then in 2005, I took a class called like by 2005, I was starting to have some personal issues in my life. Um, and I think for some reason, when you, you start to struggle or when you start to have a harder time than you've had in your life before, that opens the door or the window to looking at some things that you maybe would never look at if your life was going along as planned. And I um, ended up in this class, I had gone back to school, and I ended up in this class called the Sociology of Drug Use. And um, in the, during the course of the class, the, I found, you know, I learned about like the Dark Alliance and the whole thing with like Gary Webb and Freeway Ricky Ross. And I also learned about um, COINTELPRO, and I learned about MK Ultra, and the funny thing is when, like, there was something when I heard that term, it was familiar to me, like I didn't know where from, and I was aware that like what they were, what was being described as MK Ultra in the class was not as far as it went. They were just basically talking about like the acid experiments where they would give, like, have prostitutes give men acid and then surveil them while they like basically interrogated them or questioned them or that kind of thing, and then shortly after that. Um, so that was interesting, and like once that MK Ultra thing got in my head, I kind of couldn't let it go, and you know, like I started looking into stuff. And shortly after that, my brother died unexpectedly, and that just kind of sent me into a hole. Like I really disassociated from the world and just started kind of looking into stuff. And um, I started looking into 9/11 more in terms of conspirat conspiratorial aspects of it. Started you know looking into things like you know chemtrails and the new world order and GMOs and stuff like that. And somewhere not too long after that, I came across um, a video of Duncan O'Finian talking about MKUltra, talking about mind control. And what he was talking about, I had this feeling of, um, it's not, not, not this feeling of, oh, that's a crazy story. My feeling was that like he seemed familiar to me and that I had forgotten about that. And so that really sent me down this path of really like looking into mind control. And I was so obsessed with it that like, you know, in hindsight, many years later, when I came to understand what was actually going on with me and myself and that, you know, I had, you know, had some, you know, something to do with that. It's not surprising. But at the time I didn't understand why I couldn't let it go. You know, most people I would show them that they'd be like, wow, that's really weird. And for me, I just couldn't let it go. And all during this period of time, I continued to participate in dance music. And so I'd say sometime at like, you know, sometime after, 
I always had weird experiences with dance music from the very first rave I ever went to, but I started to become questioning or suspicious of some of the weirdness after some time, probably after 2005, around 2006. And I started to notice um, many layers of things. So like, well, I, you know, obviously I did still enjoy it and I still do. Like when I'm at the party, like I'm sure I'm doing the same thing that you're doing whenever you look at any music or any kind of any media or anything like that. Like you're taking it in for what it seems to be, but then you're also doing this sort of occult esoteric analysis of it. You're looking for mind control aspects. You're doing all this kind of stuff. And what I found was that it was the perfect dance music was actually the perfect vector for not just a mass kind of mind control, but for actually direct MK Ultra programming. Mm -hmm. And so those were that that's sort of, you know, my many um, layers of awakening to, to some of that. I hope that kind of answered the question you were looking for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have some kind of similar experiences where um, I think I was, I don't know, I was like 19 or something when 9-11 happened. And uh, I actually got really sick before it happened. And I went home from college for a few days. Um, it was kind of random. It wasn't like a cold or anything. I just, uh, my, my body felt very achy. I just felt really tired. I thought I had like some messed up illness or something. And this is just a few days before it happened. And I remember I felt terrible on the day it happened. So I was just sleeping on the couch, like feeling like shit. And my dad comes running in. He's like, Oh my God, this thing happened. And like, it was kind of funny in a different way. I didn't care because I felt like such crap. I was laying there. I'm like, Oh, okay, whatever. Like, let me be, you know? And it's, it's kind of, in a weird way, I think a blessing in disguise because I never watched any of the footage. You didn't see the trauma of like the planes hitting over and over and over again on TV. I was just like kind of, kind of bypass the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I have my own thoughts on it too. Like not, not anything nefarious, but I was just kind of like, man, this is just weird. Like why the hell, why would they just, you know, why wouldn't they blow up the freaking? why wouldn't they put all their attacks on Washington DC? Like I just, it was just, like, that's like a strange target. I don't know. I just didn't really understand, like, why that would even be a target. And I, I just didn't think about it after that. I was just like, whatever. And I kind of just didn't care. Like you said, not in a mean way, but just sort of like, you know, life moves on and whatever. And, and also what you were talking about with, like, you know, something traumatic happening, like, um you know, even just like you said, breaking your neck. I mean, that's a pretty serious thing. I, I've never luckily I, I've been an athlete to varying degrees throughout my life. And I've never had any like major breaks or stuff like that, but I can definitely see how that does change you and how you look at things. And, and same thing with like, you know, family dying and whatever. My mother died when I was 11 and that kind of changes how you look at things. It makes you grow up in a different way, kind of quicker and uh, re-examine stuff. So it just puts you, I think in tune with what's going on in the, the uh, underneath the surface of things, you know, you just kind of, it's like an intuitive thing. You you see and observe, but at the same time, you're just kind of like, hmm, something's not right here. You don't maybe not not quite know why. So it's kind of interesting hearing you talking about those things because it kind of relates to stuff that has happened in my life, but just with a different set of circumstances. Um, yeah, yeah. The uh, it's interesting what you said about um, being sick on the day of nine eleven, and it just sort of reminded me of something in that um, I can't. I think it was just within a few weeks, I can't remember if it was before, I think it was after, I think it was like in, into late September and October, I came down with um, meningitis and meningitis, like I was having, like I was didn't feel well and I couldn't really figure out what it was. It wasn't like a cold, like it, there was a headache and a body aches, but the headache wouldn't go away with normal things that would make headaches go away. And after like a day and a half of suffering with that, I went to the hospital and found out I had meningitis and oh, wow. they wanted to do all this stuff and I didn't want, I said no and whatever, they just gave me fluids and I went home and Fortunately, I got better after like a day or so, but it's that same kind of feeling that you were describing. So that is it. And it happened really just right around the time of 9-11. I wonder if many of us who are sort of super sensitive to some of that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, it's really funny you said that because that was actually what I went to get tested for <laughs> when I was sick. Because I was at a university and like apparently there's serious stuff that they kind of look for living in dorms and shit like that. So I don't know. I, it's funny you mentioned that. <laughs> Yeah, well, they wanted to do, I, I, they like, they basically, they couldn't prove that I had meningitis or not because I wouldn't let them do a spinal tap. They basically were tr sure I had it, but they weren't sure if it was like viral or bacterial. And if it was bacterial and I didn't let them do what they needed to do, they said I was going to die. And 
having already broken my neck, anything going into my spine is terrifying to me. So mm. I just said no, and I was willing to take the risk that maybe I would die, you know, because I don't, you know, whatever. But yeah, the same kind of thing. I was living in an apartment building, so they were like saying the same thing, like, you know, these things travel through the ventilation systems and whatever. But I just wonder, it would be interesting to hear how, if there was, if there are any other people like us out there who around the time of 9-11 came down with something like that. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, uh, the other thing we can talk about real quick, um, you're the co-host of Off Planet Radio with Randy Moggins, and I've listened to your guys' show, um, you know, off and on here and there, and I, I, I like your guys' vibe. You kind of just do your own thing. You don't really, um, you know, you don't play the whole drama with other people in the truth or world, no shill accusations or video responses and stuff like that. I like how you guys are just kind of calm and and you stay all, out of all that crap i i always think that that's a, a sign of maturity when people can kind of you know have have a program that you have a, a decent amount of listeners you're a presence you have a lot of the guests on that kind of go around certain circuits but you keep it you know respectful and that's uh that's really one of the reasons why um why i wanted to talk to you because i i listened to you on mark devlin's um, podcast about the electronic dance scene which we'll be talking about in a little bit but um i'm just curious how did you connect with randy and what attracted you to his show first of all thank you for being the first person ever in my life to call me calm because <laughs> <laughs> i have a lot of energy but actually that's the truth is is that um most people who get to know me find that i'm actually i'm very laid back i have a lot of physical energy you know i was a gymnast i was used to training six or seven hours a day and i'm just a high energy person but inside i really am more calm than, than most people would suspect um, yeah, you know, we don't, you know, we, here's the thing, like, I mean, first of all, there's a million other people out there saying that so-and-so's a shell and so-and-so's a shell, so that isn't exactly unique material, <laughs> but, you know, after years and years, I mean, I've been listening to alternative media, you know, for 15 plus years at this point in various forms, and, um, of course, there are shells out there, and the ones that are obviously shells, we all know who they are, we don't really need to have a discussion about that, um, but, some of these other things that come and go, like I think those ones that are obvious and they're obviously in on it and doing something intentionally nefarious are actually probably pretty few. And I think some other people, you know, get caught up in stuff that they don't even understand what they're caught up in. You know, their mind control is a real thing and people who are in the alternative media are not immune to that. And, you know, also just, you know, so many things can happen once you step into like the public arena, you know? And so, I think there's a lot of people out there who, you know, may do some good work and then attention comes to them and then people there. So there's an attempt to try and control them and they fall for it for a little while later, they might figure it out and we're all on a journey here. And so I think for some people going through a stage of their, you know, of their life where, you know, they think they're not necessarily in control of what they're saying and doing, even though they think they are, might be part of that. And, and that's something to work through and, and grow out of. And I also think that, um, one really important thing in this journey that we're all on is learning to develop discernment. And that's an individual process for each person. And I think having people out there that aren't reliable <laughs> helps with the discernment process. You know what I mean? Like you need to decide for yourself how, you know, you need to develop your own filter for information. Like the way I go about it is I listen to a wide, ver an eclectic variety of sources, people I agree with, people I disagree with, people I really like, people I can't stand. And I sort of, you know, cross-reference all of the things that I hear and decide for myself what I believe to be, is, what I believe is true, you know. And I've also come, you know, after many years, I came to the conclusion that it doesn't matter where information comes from if it's good information. And sometimes I've gotten really good information from people that are not my favorite people. And other times people who I really enjoy, maybe not even intentionally, have given me information that's nonsense. And, you know, like it's not even this, something that they necessarily did intentionally or whatnot. And, you know, this is we're all on, you know, our own individual, you know, path here. And, um, you know, so unless we, you know, unless something's happening that's really, you know, dangerous or whatever, I think it's actually better to just let people figure out for themselves um, mm -hmm who's a good source of information and who's not. And just because someone once was and later isn't or vice or the other way around, like it doesn't, you know, it's, you don't want to throw the whole, the, the baby out with bathwater. You want to sort of glean what you can from things and, 
and move on. And, you know, some, there's people who are important at one step of your journey and later you don't look at their information anymore, but you know, you would never have gotten to where you are if it hadn't been through, you hadn't been through the phase of listening to them or, you know, whatever. So, um, that's one of the reasons we don't do it, but also there's just other stuff we're much more interested in. We're ac actually much more interested in um, what the, the mechanics of whatever this is that we are in and what is time actually? Is there really space? Is the only space actually between our ears? Is, you know what I mean? Is this, um, are we controlling the system or is the system be, you know controlling us? Like those, there are so many bigger questions for me that I, I'd rather pursue the answer of than, you know, which agency Alex Jones is working for, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, so, I yeah. hear you. So the way I got, the way I hooked up with Randy is I was actually a, a very, very long time listener of her, his show, actually way back to before it was ever called Off Planet Radio when it was called Exotica. And I found Randy during that period of time when I had discovered Duncan O'Finian and what he was talking about with MKUltra and just couldn't let it go. And I found my way, you know, he had done a couple of interviews, it was very early on when he was speaking out. He'd done a couple of interviews, but the ones that were most interesting to me were the ones he did with Randy. And um, so I went back and listened to everything Randy had done before that. And, uh, you know, even things, even topics that are, weren't really that uh, like my topics so much because he'd done a lot of stuff with UFOs and aliens. Um, I, for some reason, I, I you know, it, it seemed important to me to listen to everything he had done. And I'm glad I did because, you know, even, you know, he evolved in his position on some of those things too, looking at some of those things more as mind control experiences or my labs or whatever. And so I listened, started listening to everything he did. And I was like a many, many, many years listener. Um, but I never reached out to him because I was lost in my own mess of my life of being mind controlled and, and destructive behavior and, um, really just it, it stuck, it, it's really stuck and, um, didn't feel like, you know, he'd be interested in hearing from someone like me. And at a certain point, um, when I had started to recognize what had gone on with me and pulled my life together, I decided to, you know, we had a mutual friend and uh, he connected us and we started talking and we had decided we'd do maybe a show about music together sometime, about, you know, electronic music or just music in general or music and mind control. And then through the course of just chatting, uh, he invited me on his show as a guest and it went well and he invited me to be, you know, an occasional host and producer and it turned into me being a full-time producer and co-host with him. And, um, I really, it's a, it's a really an amazing, an ama amazing experience to work with him and to get to know, um, to meet uh, like all these people that we interview and also a lot of the listeners and share stories and find things in common and be able to verify things from your own, from, you know, compare things from your life to people, things in other people's lives and really get a lot of, um, the kind, only kind of validation we're going to get because there isn't going to be a file sitting around saying we did this and that to Emily Moyer on this and that day. And you know <laughs> what I mean? So, um, it's been really cool and I really appreciate him for taking a chance on an unknown like me and also somebody with a unique personality. And, um, I, I really enjoy working with him. We have a great time and, um, yeah, that's how, that's how it happened. Yeah. I, I like your guys dynamic. It's nice to have when you have co-hosts to have somebody that kind of mirrors the other where he's, you know, he kind of, uh, sits back and just interjects here and there. And you're the more like animated one. And what I meant by like laid back is like, you guys are laid back and that you don't get involved in the drama, but you have like, you know, you can't have two people who are going to be like very fiery or something like that. So he's kind of just, uh, I don't know, like this more like earthy presence. You're like this more like air type presence of just kind of observing and all these sorts of things. So I, I enjoy listening to your guys show and, um, well, thank you. The other thing uh, you mentioned talking about just like, you know, everybody's own personal journey into this and, and how that kind of, you know, overlaps into the whole shill and infighting crap. It's sort of like, um, you know, I, I kind of, I look at all this stuff that's going on is like, there's greater metaphysical forces at play with everything. And so when somebody yeah. might be, you know, uh, becoming more popular in the quote unquote truther circuits. I think that it's not necessarily like, you know, the government's after them or something like that. But like, you know, I think that metaphysical things take notice. And if there's things that they're impacting that don't help their agenda, then they're going to, you know, make some sort of move. And I think that that's really, I think, at the heart of what's going on with a lot of things. And I, I think it. that people's psychological 
nature with all this. Like you can get broken down really easily. And so when somebody's going through a tough time and they start going off on something that you're like, they believe that now, you know what I mean? Just you have to have some understanding for them and that people are going to believe really wacky shit because I've definitely believed some very wacky shit and I've had to come out of that. And I'm probably still believe some wacky shit that, you know, three months later, I'd be like, oh, my God, I can't believe I thought that, you know. But like you said, it's part of the journey. It's part of ob uh, observing things and exchanging information, because I think that that's the one thing that when I connect with people in this community, uh, it, it's more that I like that we're just kind of sharing things. None of us are saying we know exactly what's going on. Um, and I think that that's a level of humility that is helpful because we're all we're allowed to have somebody, you know, believe this, you know, version of spirituality or, or this uh, that this is real or this is a hoax. But allow them to believe that even if you don't agree and still find value in the things that they do that you do agree with. And it just shows a level of maturity and respect for people because, you know, in your regular life, these are like, this is how you deal with your friends. You know, you're like your friends are going to screw up. They're going to do things you don't like, but you, they're still your friends. You, you work through it. And unfortunately, when it's mostly kind of like Internet relationships, you know, you haven't really met people in person. It's a lot harder to, to keep that, you know, and that's why I think. All of the fighting happens, and then basically, like you said, I don't think there's actually that many legitimately paid government shills. I think that it's more in the interest of the controllers to make us think that there's they're everywhere and make us paranoid, yep. and then we just start fighting each other. Absolutely, and I also think that you know the phase that the truther movement or the alternative information community. I think the phase we're in now because. You know, it's been in existence for like 20 plus years now in some way or another, right? That this sort of people being aware of this kind of stuff. I mean, longer than that, but like, the, but there's been like a movement around it. Yeah. I think the phase that we're in now that is probably the most important phase for our growth and development and for being able to actually affect something instead of just talking about things is to be able to have a respectful dialogue with someone who you disagree with, to be able to talk about things and disagree with each other, but not name call or the, that person's a shield because you disagree. Like some people believe people die in these shootings. Some people don't. You know what I mean? Like, I, like if, if, if the amount of hours that have been spent like screaming and fighting and wasting over that, <laughs> like is wasted screaming about that. Yeah. And obviously, we can all agree that it's being controlled and something. It's not happening the way they say. And so, yeah, something's you know, not into, right. We all know that. Something's not right. <laughs> you know, so I think like I think the best way to advance like advance this and and, and you know I don't really feel like I'm part of movement, but whatever, we t this is how things are referred to it as, like, is to really be able to have difficult conversations without becoming so highly emotional and so reactive that you start to look crazy or stupid. Because we're getting to a point where things are so funky in the out outer world that, like, people who would never have been in any way open to any of this stuff might be for a minute. And if you can have a sane, grounded conversation with them in that moment where their mind is open for one second, you're going to get a lot farther if you're able to respect, like have a respectful conversation, even though you might disagree about something, than if you start like getting emotional and name calling and accusing and telling them they're stupid and asleep and all that kind of shit, you know? Mm. Oh, yeah, so definitely. I feel like the what we all have to like really work on our maturity level and the way we go about talking about these things. And um, I try to practice that. <laughs> yeah. Even what you said before about... Um finding the value in people who are giving out quote unquote bad information because it's a, it's a test of your own discernment. And this is one thing that drives me crazy. It's that like people, I'll notice this happen a lot where somebody, you know, puts out some information, this is how it is. And it's pretty flawed. And then somebody will jump on that as an opportunity to call them out on it and then bring people over to their channel. And I think a lot of the times right. they're just doing that because they, have an opportunity to kind of look like the hero in a way or like these little yeah. subtle psychological games. And it's kind of funny because we're going to talk about electronic dance music. This is a kind of a weird parallel, but um, I, I don't really listen to a lot of that kind of music, but I had stuff on SoundCloud because I'm a musician and I noticed these little games would go on there where someone would like your song because you know they wanted you to go over to their thing and check out their stuff. And I knew that this would happen that they didn't even listen to the song because there's no play count but I got a like, and I'm just like, it's just like, this is so f stupid. You know, it's just like these yeah. childish little games to try to get people to come, come look at your stuff and you're doing it in a way that's just kind of disingenuous. So I, I find a lot of those things going on with the, the truth community. And, you know, I, I get it. Like I understand 
Like everyone's got their problems. I, I kind of, I don't like that stuff. I don't like respect it when it happens, but I'm not going to like completely dismiss somebody for it. Like you said, you can't throw the baby out in the bathwater. And I think that's the ultimate test of quote unquote, understanding discernment uh, within yeah. all of this. And also I think the definition of an intelligent person is the ability to hold two opposing thoughts in your head at the same time. And there's with some of this stuff, it, it is, we need to stop looking at everything as an either or because some things are both in. And like a prime example of that is the, all this stuff with whatever the shape of the earth is, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, the whole thing is, you know, you're either a flat earther or you're a ball licker or whatever the fuck they call people, <laughs> right? Well, ball tart like, or flat tart, one or the other. Whatever it is, right? <laughs> so like, like it, both people, whatever camp you're in, you're assuming that it ha ha yours must, must, it has to be the way you're saying and not the way the other person is saying. Well, what about if we're living in a simulation? If we're living in a simulation, then it could be both flat and round based on what they're projecting at that point, right? If we're living in a simulation, we're not necessarily living in the same world every day, you know? So like some of these things that we're dealing with now because the world is so strange are really more better explained by a both and scenario than an either or scenario. Yeah. And, so, you know, like I just, do, you know, I don't, obviously we've been lied to about where we are and what we're, you know, what we're on and what we're in and all that kind of stuff. So I think we can all agree about that, that like NASA's bullshit and we've been lied to about everything. But, you know, to, to basically um, separate yourself into these like camps where it's either this or this and it can't possibly be anything else is like really actually accomplishing the job of the controllers for them. They don't even have to do anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. I looked into a lot of the, the flat earth stuff and I do find it fascinating. Totally. But yeah. to, to me, the, the, mo the value in it is that I don't even, what the hell is space? Like, what is it really? Like, yeah. you know, like, I don't trust NASA. Uh, you know, if, it's like if you fake something like the moon landing, which I'm I'm pretty sure they did. That's just me. But, like, it's like you can't cry wolf. Once you do something like that, why should I trust anything you say? And I don't care how realistic it looks. Like, you know, who knows with technology what you can do. And so, you know, I, that's where I can resonate with. But I don't want to jump all in onto something that I just don't know. Yeah. I just think that that's not a very like the same the smart same reason they're saying <laughs> the same reason they're saying that there's no way someone can prove the Earth is round. Is the same with not being able to prove it's flat until we can all get up and go high enough to be able to see for ourselves. Because really, we should only trust what we can uncover with our own senses. Yeah, and, and even own... that they're, they're debating, you know balloon yeah. footage and stuff i right, can see right. a little curve like you know whatever the flow shop it you know, oh god yeah some things, <laughs> you can't, some things you'll never know until you are, have another perspective on them and right now as far as i'm concerned we're, people don't actually leave earth and so we're stuck here you know what i mean <laughs> yeah so, yeah i agree yeah. <laughs> um well let's uh transition here into the main focus of our conversation which is electronic dance music and yeah. um <clears throat> Uh, I just wanted to, well, well, the reason I found what you talked about um, with Mark and what you've, you know, talked about a little bit on your show um, and also what uh, Steve Outram did with Jan Irving on the Burning Man stuff, I, I just, I, it blew my mind all of the, the electronic and kind of like tech world connections that related to my research with the occult and like the transhumanist agenda and there's a lot of weird esoteric stuff there that because I'm not in that scene, like I was just completely unaware of. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is like crazy, The especially a lot of like the Burning Man stuff. And so um, since this crosses over into a lot of my research, that's really why I wanted to talk to you about it. And one, one of the main things I, I found is that, you know, like the uh, the, the the figure of Prometheus, you know, the 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 guy who's hanging out at Rockefeller Center. Um, yeah. you know, that, that's the whole idea of like breaking free of restrictions and limitations of the material world, which is essentially represented by, by Saturn. And this is done through, you know, the divine intellect, the, the divine spark of creativity. And this is giving kind of technology to mankind. And that's why like ancient aliens and they're all obsessed with technology is Prometheus right. entertainment. <laughs> go figure. Right. And so yeah. this whole evolution in conjunction with spirituality but the occult spirituality, so it's not very obvious. And then this idea of technology, this is all kind of, I see it all funneling into the same thing where in a lot of this occult doctrine, this their pure spirit of divinity is androgynous. And if you're trying to bring this as above, so below union of spirit and matter, then I can understand why 
if their idea of deity is androgynous and you're trying to make that into the material, then there you go. The whole gender evolution and transhumanism and then Silicon Valley kind of just gets thrown into that because of all of the technologies. So um, to wrap up my little point here, <laughs> uh, I just like to use like the, the Zodiac astrological system to kind of categorize things. And so I'd say the theme of all of this is very Neptune combined with Uranus in archetype. It's sort of like, this mystical dream, you know, visionary realm that the kind of like the EDM is tied to and, and the, the realm beyond borders, you know, that infinite ocean of oneness, as they call it, and kind of like new age philosophy. And then Uranus is breaking free into that through rebellion and technology and innovation and stuff like that. So that's kind of like the main theme astrologically to all this. So to begin... Uh, when did you first start realizing that there might not be something quite right about the electronic dance music scene? And what were some of these early red flags that uh, you happened across? So quickly, before I answer that, your astrological sort of analysis is very interesting because I used to tell people that I had a condo on Pluto and that some of the parties that I attended were like dancing on the rings of Saturn. So <laughs> there you go. Um, so that's funny that you say that. But um, so, okay. So I, I would say like when I the first I first went to like a rave. Like I was always into I always liked electronic music. I was like I started break dancing like back in the eighties. Like on you know, we used to go down to like Venice Beach and see the break dancers and then come home and copy them. And since I was a gymnast, I could do like all the tricks and stuff like that. Um so I always liked like dancey kind of music. And then I went to my first like rave in the late nineties and like to be quite honest, like the first time I didn't love it. But I recognized that it was like something really weird was going on. Like it was like really like opened like a door or a portal or something. And I became like much more aware of like all sorts of just like strange energies, even at that very first party. And I kept going, like some people where I was working, they were going and I kept going and like I liked it more and more. And I just started to like, yeah, like even though I was going with a few people I knew, I was hardly talking to anyone there. Like I was like basically just like observing and like doing ecstasy and like dancing a little bit, but like really more just like kind of in awe of this whole thing and like feeling um, it was almost like you had like a, a doorway or a passage sort of that connected you to almost everyone else there, like a, to their minds a little, even though I wasn't necessarily talking to anyone or whatever, there was a feeling of like, being part of something and at that time I didn't see that as a red flag but it was something I hadn't experienced before I had been pretty isolated most of my life as a gymnast it's even though you're training with other people it's somewhat of a solitary kind of existence you know like it's competitive and whatever so there was that and then when I moved to Austin in like 1999 something changed like I the scene there was much warmer feeling to me and I made a lot of friends and something clicked. Like, I don't know. I literally remember the day that I was at the Aust in the Austin City Music Hall and I was dancing and something clicked and all of a sudden, like, I was always an okay dancer, but man, I could really dance. Like I was getting, like I, you know, I started popping and house dancing and I'd always been able to break dance, but I felt the music in a completely different way. It was like literally happened in one night. Like I can remember where I was standing when that happened. And what came with that was also an incredible, basically, download of information about the history of dance music. Like, I literally went, like, went home from the party the next day knowing, like, un being able to dance in a way I had never been able to dance before and with this intuitive set of knowledge about the history of dance music. And um, what was funny is I became pretty well-known in the scene there pretty quickly, and people started to ask me to, like, write for their dance music little magazines and things like that. So like, I, I didn't really have that much knowledge about it. But what I found when I went to like research some things was that the downloaded information that I had received was actually really accurate, which in hindsight at this point now makes me wonder how much of my programming was based around drawing me towards dance music eventually. Um, but from there on out, I was really, really into it. I was going to parties every weekend, sometimes two or three parties on a weekend. I was break dancing and popping in the circles and really getting into the music, you know, like it was becoming the center focus of my life, even though I had gone to Austin to go to go back to school and whatever. And um, I started to have like, oh, like 
two, I started doing acid, like, a, you know, on a frequent basis. And I had done ecstasy before that, but that was never really my thing. I got into the acid and I really enjoyed like the psychological analysis aspect of it. But I also started to like really become observant on a whole different level than I had become prior. Like I started to observe myself and then observe myself observing myself. And pretty quickly I, I had like a first sort of out of body experience while breakdancing. I was literally on the side of the circle watching myself break dance in the circle. And then like when I was done landing back in my body on the side of the circle and everybody was looking at me and clapping and I didn't know what was going on. Like it was very like, it was, it was not, not scary, but it was one of those things where I was like, okay, like I'm not in Kansas anymore, but I liked it. You know, I, I liked it. And I, um, I remember I had a lot of friends there, but I also, and I know what you're talking about when you know people talk about when they're like, um, you know, there's like a, like a unity or like a vibe and that I could, there was that, but I never fully bought into that. Like I was always mostly having a solitary experience, you know, like within that, like I had a lot of friends, I was talking a lot, but I was like doing serious psychological analysis of myself while I was like break dancing at parties. It was a very unusual experience. And I don't know how many other people really do that, or I'm sure there are some. Um, so I understood like the power of this music. And I think it goes to um, just the, you know, the rhythmic, the, like the drum beats of it, the rhythmic aspects of it, and then the layers of frequency, you know, so people have done drum circles and stuff from the beginning of time and use that for spiritual experiences. And then you layer in all these other frequencies and it becomes like being able to like work through different layers of reality, both within, within and without, you know, without yourself, like inside yourself and outside yourself. And, you know, so there was that. So I was experiencing that and enjoying it. And, um, you know, I would say probably, you know, I, I noticed things were funny, though. Like, I did understand, I was noticing, like, that, like, time didn't add up for me anymore. And, like, just certain aspects of, like, physics and things, like, were funny. Uh, just, I started, like, the world didn't make, like, it didn't make sense to me in the same way that it had made sense to me prior. And... You know, so that was interesting. And then I would say that, like, that I went through, like, a long phase of, like, not doing any drugs at parties. And um, then I got into sort of mushrooms, and that was, you know, which is probably my favorite of the psychedelics. But I would say I really first started noticing that something was wrong um, in, like, two, like I said in the opening, like, maybe 2005 or 2006. I had moved back to Los Angeles, and I didn't have a lot of friends here. So my experiences at parties were much more solitary and I got into sort of like closing my eyes when I danced and just sort of disappearing into my own world, which was fascinating on many levels. But I also, when my eyes were open, would kind of observe what was going on with people. And I just noticed that like there was energies in the room that were not accounted for necessarily by the people that were there. And I started to have experiences where I would see like um, people change. Like I would see people kind of over time, like I remember I was at this one party one time and I'm, these people were going into like, there was like this hole in the wall and people were like going back there and couple, coming out a couple hours later and like seeming totally different. And this one girl that I've known around parties for a while, like ever since she went into that hole and came out, like she's never been the same. Like she can't, she doesn't look at me at the eye, in the eye when we talk, she hardly will say anything to me. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know what was going on there. Like, you know, they call them the parties that I go to like now and I've been going to for the past like 10 or 15 years are not raves. They're like um, actually for the past 20, I mean, since like 2001, they're underground warehouse parties. And there's a reason that they're called underground, not just because they're secret, but you know, um, especially here in Los Angeles, there's a vast system of underground networks and tunnels underneath the city. And I think that, um, there's like a coming together of those things when, when parties occur. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say probably around 2005, 2006, the same period of time when my brother died and when I was, you know, becoming aware on like a present level of um, like at mind control and stuff like that, I started to see how it wasn't like, like that, that the way people thought about mind control, like from the 60s and 70s, like the classic form of MKUltra how easy it could be done with this and didn't have to be done like in this like torturous um, 
sort of like create an assassin kind of way that you could basically <laughs> program a person through frequency and sound and you know especially with like raves or parties like creating the energetic signatures or events that certain ley lines and points on, on the geography that were meaningful and powerful of which there are a lot here in Los Angeles it's not a mistake that Hollywood is here mm -hmm. um, and so that sort of started my um, in some ways descent into the dark underworld of electronic dance music and of Los Angeles. That's interesting that you were talking about um, kind of like feeling like this, this download or, and like this, it was almost like you, you, well, you also talked about how you felt like program for something, which I, I kind of want to ask you about in a second, but yeah. um, I have um, the, one of the, the, the people who, was kind of one of the bigger reasons for me, quote unquote, waking up. Um, it, it's funny because he's talked about, we, we've talked about a lot of like kind of spiritual things uh, in relation to all this new world order stuff. And it, it's funny because uh, I, I know him and I've like looked at his, his, his chart and his moon is opposite mine. Mine's in Virgo, his is in Pisces. And he always talks about this download thing. Like he was just mm -hmm. like, oh, I'll just kind of like, even for just him doing work and stuff, like he, he builds guitars, he'd be like, yeah, I just kind of look at it and all of a sudden something appears and it just, I mean, yep. it just happens. And I'm like, oh, I'm like the opposite. <laughs> like I have to work through all these details and all these little things. And, and it's just kind of hilarious. Like, like I, I hear people have like talked about that, but I haven't really like had that experience before. I'm like the one that has like the, the Virgo Saturn and uh, Capricorn nature where it's just like, I have to like go through all these levels of working and figuring shit out and details and stuff like that before I, come to some sort of epiphany is like I don't really uh like I I kind of sense the intuitive vibe around me but I need to match that with like physical observations and stuff like that so it's kind of interesting hearing you talk about that and um I just kind of like relating it to like astrological themes because I think it's interesting but you were yeah. you were saying that you had uh some programming from before and I think you were alluding to like gymnastics or something um so what, so, what, what did you what did you mean by that? So real quickly, just to um, tie something up. So my moon is also in Pisces. Oh, really? <laughs> um, yeah, my moon is also in Pisces. And yeah, that's how I get most of my information is through downloads. And then I will go look into it to back to, to like see like to back it up. And it's amazing how accurate or close to accurate a lot of it is. Um, but also, if you look into like um, do you, people look into like some of the work like someone like Fritz Springmeier did where he talks about the Aleister Crowley and the creation of a moon child, which is what the ideal for certain kinds of programming in MKUltra is to have a child that is a moon child um, and someone who is born uh, with their moon in Pisces and of certain, you know, like with their, you know, certain, certain signs and certain mm -hmm. times that, you know, whatever that they're more practical or eligible also genetics. Well, it's, it's a mutable sign too. And so that's sort of what people say the danger of Pisces is, 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 is being able to hold on to your own identity and have boundaries and borders. That's like one of the challenges. Yeah. So, um, you know, I fit most of the criteria for the creation of a moon child. Um, and, you know, one of the things that this whole truth journey um, has been for me was really the discovery of my own background um, with, MK Ultra like programs. Um, and I was born here in Los Angeles, California, and was born and pretty quickly put into Hollywood industry and um, was uh, at the age of two in a movie called Rainbow about Judy Garland's life. And where I say that was the beginning of my um, Wizard of Oz programming. And if you look into like. Um, or the Project Rainbow, right? Yeah. Rainbow, pro <laughs> well, Rainbow, Rainbow programming over the rainbow where the bluebirds fly, Project Bluebird. Um, and, you know, the hospital that I was born at, I was born at Cedars of Lebanon, which is very now it's called Cedars of Sinai, well known as, you know, MK Ultra Doctor kind of hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, is, uh, the, uh, the original place where it was located is now also the Church of Scientology. Scientology is also tied heavily in with MK Ultra. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard was very good friends with Aleister Crowley and, all, and that, that, you know, those types of people. Um, you know, he, L. Ron Hubbard was, you know, worked for the CIA and ran like safe houses for mind control programs and things like that. Um, you know, I basically came, you know, what, what, you know, and it's one of those things that like, you don't have proof. You're not going to be able to say, here's the documents that show this happened to me. But what I started to realize in 
you know, my research was that part of the reason it was so emotional and so, I mean, during the years I was doing some of my deepest research on this stuff, I became totally unfunctional as a human. And, you know, like it's awful stuff to look at, but a lot of people research and don't become unfunctional. And, you know, at a certain point I started to recognize that a lot of the people that I was researching, like that I had a lot of things in common with them, um, that some of the same things they were talking about were with me to the point where it was like almost everything. But you, like it's scary when you have that realization. At the same time, I was starting to recognize what was going on with the dance music. And then I read Dave McGowan's work and I was like, oh, this is totally going on with dance music. And it's almost, that's like the most terrifying point when like you figured something out about what's going on in the world and also what's going on with yourself. But you're like, this fucking sounds crazy. So I'm not going to tell anyone because that will just make me look crazy. Mm -hmm. And that actually like puts you in, in some ways like the most dangerous spot. And I, you know, was having a period of time in my life where like really weird things were happening. And, and some of them involved some things that were happening when I would go to, you know, underground parties and things like that. And um, at a certain point, like it just became, um, you know, I was having very strange, like um, psychotronic interruptions of my, my dreams and my thoughts and things like that. And um, I just got to the point where like, I couldn't, like, it was obvious to me, but I, like I was, it was going to be that I had to find some way to like talk about it so I could really figure out what was going on or I wasn't going to make it. And, but I also knew that like being stuck the way I was stuck and being unfunctional and destructive, which I was, was not going to help do me any favors with people being able to take me seriously. And so I really had to like, I white knuckled it in a lot of ways. Like I pulled my shit together and I found a way, you know, with some, a few people, uh, the, the love, kindness and help of a few people found my way to be able to start talking about some of the things that were happening to me and some of my experiences. And what I found was people like, you know, better reception from people than I expected. And as I began to talk about the issues, my life, I started to be able to pull my life together in a way that it hadn't been in more than 20 years. And so for me, that kind of became the evidence that my thoughts and feelings were correct. Um, you know, as it, anybody who's been through any of this will say, um, that you're never a hundred percent sure. And we always have doubts. Like, what if I'm like, what if this is just like me making it up in my head and whatnot? But, you know, I'll, you, as I've gotten better at researching this stuff, I've been able to pull up things about my own life and my own family and some of the things my family have been involved with, you know, that are so strange that it's just like, there's no way this could be coincidence. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but I don't, you know, some people are like very certain of like a particular kind of involvement. Like Duncan was, you know, used in a very particular way, you know, like assassin and that kind of stuff. And someone like a uh, white wolf and Atzigan as well, or someone like uh, Elisa E who's spoken so much about, you know, her use as like a sex slave and whatever. And, you know, I guess in some ways I'm still in some of the early years of figuring things out for myself. And I don't know that I have quite that dramatic of a story, but I think there's lots of people out there like me. Like, I don't think the MK Ultra experience is that rare. Mm -hmm. I think like the really extreme cases are rare, but I think that like pretty like, you know, the, this program emanates out of something called project talent. And if you've shown any kind of uh, high aptitude in with in your intellect or with your physical ability or your creative ability, particularly if you have some blend of those things. And for me, I'm a creative thinker and I was also an athlete, you know what I mean? And so, you know, and I was a good student and whatever you find yourself being, if, you know, pulled into things, tested for things, all of those like funny tests you got to see if you were like special and gifted and whatever, those weren't for no reason. Mm -hmm. They were looking for people to pull into some of this stuff. And, um, you know, so for me, this process has been uncovering some of that and the dance music was really wrapped into it. What I meant when I said that I wondered if I had been previously programmed for stuff like that, you know, some of the things that I was really attracted to as a kid, I was really attracted to like breakdancing into movies like Flashdance and Footloose and whatever, um, and really always like dancey music and have some very strange memories of like being by myself in uh, roller skating rinks late at night with flashing strobe lights and things like that. And there'd be loud music playing, but there not being anyone else there. And in some ways that like, you know, some of the first raves I ever went to were in skating rinks, right? And mm -hmm. so I thought that was like an interesting parallel. I went to a skating rink last year for the first time since I was a child and it did bring up some stuff. And one of the things that was interesting is on the floor of the skating rink, there's all these like geometry patterns. And um, for me, when I started to have really, really deep inner visions with music and dancing, the sacred geometry was one of the things that really, really came up. 
and I seem to have some affinity and awareness of it that like I don't know where it came from um you know and so just some of those like some of those tiebacks and just the way that like the way dance music unfolded for me and the way like I'm so like like I feel so part of that music like I feel I can't explain it like when I'm dancing you know like anyone who's ever seen me dance like sure there's better dancers out there than me but I love it like I love dancing and it's like I am so a part of that music and whatever that is that you know sure that could be like natural and organic but I also have to wonder if some of my affinity for it come it was you know sort of preordained or predestined mm -hmm. you know yeah it's interesting you talk about that because I was just thinking about um, you, you know, I just wonder how people get selected for these sorts of things. Like you think about people like Britney Spears or Christina Aguilera or whatever, they all go through that Mickey Mouse club. And I wonder if like, there's some process where like, you know, there's like a cultist looking at their birth charts and shit or like trying to figure that, yeah. that out. And then, you know, seeing who they're connected to and, and maybe you might've been like in that stock group and like you had some exposure to it. But luckily, you know, there wasn't anything, at least as far as you can remember that, yeah. you know, because now I like I haven't looked into it much, but there's that whole all that weird stuff going on with the gymnastics and whatever. And so you were saying like, yeah, it's just it felt kind of weird. Like I almost felt like I was programmed to be in this way. And it's just it's interesting. I mean, who knows? You don't know if that's like a nefarious thing if you don't know if that's like some higher divine thing or it's a combination of both where the nefarious well, part is trying to capitalize on your other you, connections that's that's it like i think that there i think that somehow they have figured out a way to like tap into your purpose and try and like twist it to theirs mm -hmm. right yeah but i'll just say real quickly that um as a youngster at the gym that i went to we would we were involved in this thing called mouser size which was a television show on the disney channel in the like early 80s um, so it's like an athletic version of the Mickey Mouse Club. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's that. And yeah, the, the, the gymnastics has a lot of weird stuff as well. Um, you know, I've been covering, people can go listen. I've done a couple, I did an interview with Robert Phoenix about the whole the situation with the gymnastics pedophilia scandal. And we also did a show about it as well on Off Planet Radio. And um, that's all part of it for me. I mean, like I have like an interesting, but like it's not seemingly obvious, but interesting combination of things that I've been interested in, you know, so the Hollywood, the gymnastics, and the dance music, all I, all three of those things are perfect vectors for like another level or layer of control, observation, participation of different things um, that, yeah, that just, you know, it, it seems like a weird combination, but not if you're me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I, also you're kind of talking about that. You wonder when uh, these, these, teenage pop stars have their breakout and all of a sudden they, they went from, you know, just to use like an occult allegory like that, that virgin kind of persona or, you know, like, uh, like the Virgin Mary kind of archetype thing. And then they, all of a sudden they become the whore or the harlot and they just all of a sudden just go crazy. And now they're dancing like a stripper everywhere. And it's just yeah. like you, I, I was wondering what you were talking about. I wonder if there are certain things that are programmed in. And then when something happens to them psychologically, it's like it just unleashes something that was sort of there, but in a very different way. And it's it's almost like it just happens. And it, it, that's why you have all these weird breakdowns with all of these people. Britney Spears is out there shaving her head, running around. And, you know, it's just like a big mess. <laughs> I'll say this really quickly. One of the things that I'm a little bit concerned about. So, you know, all the stuff has been made of all these gymnasts. There was hours and hours of them giving their statements against Larry Nassar and whatever. And one of the people that was included in that was Allie Raisman, of course, you know, many time Olympic medalist and a beautiful girl and an excellent, wonderful gymnast. But she gave her testimony about how she'd been abused. And then within weeks, she just was proposing basically nude for Sports Illustrated. Oh, wow. And, you know, sure, there's, I mean, I can see in one sense that it's like a reclaiming of your own sexuality and a certain kind of empowerment. But in another sense, I'm sure it was a Hollywood agent who suggested that. And is this some form of her being turned out? You know what I mean? Like, it's really, like, it just seemed to me, it, it's a little bit disturbing that within weeks of the sexual abuse stuff, th then she's naked in Sports Illustrated. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's talk more about um, EDM. And I wanted to talk about the esoteric role of the DJ. Um, sure. It seems like there's some sort of religious component where, you know, they're kind of like the priests performing rituals on this 
alter in, in some sense for like the masses below. Um, what are some strange things that you noticed about, you know, the bigger names and electronic dance music and the more prominent clubs, parties and festivals and how they might utilize, you know, occult geometry and, and logos and sigils and stage set up to, you know, prop this DJ up as the quote unquote hero fan figure. Sure. So I very early on in my electronic dance music sort of career kind of thing, I was going to some more like big raves and bigger festivals that pretty quickly lost appeal to me. And I mostly op operate or go, I mostly go to underground kind of events, but I observe a lot of other things and I've worked at some of those bigger kinds of festivals. Um, and yeah, well, first of all, like the DJ is sort of like, um, you know, the stage often looks like an altar, like a huge altar with the DJ in the middle and all this like equipment sort of around him. And he stands up there and he waves his arms in the air. And it's almost like seeing somebody like at church on Sunday, seeing the gospel or something in some mm -hmm. ways. Right. Yeah. Um, but to, also some people consider the DJ to be like the shaman or for instance, we're talking about mind control. He programs his set. Why couldn't he be programming his audience? Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's that. If you look at the way a lot of these stages are set up, like there's, you know, visuals on the background that have all, I mean, I've seen more kinds of visual shows than you can imagine. Some of them seeming like fairly innocuous, some seeming totally satanic. And, but the ones that I think are probably the most dangerous are actually the ones that like seem okay. Because like it's ones that include a lot of geometry or a lot of sigils or whatever that aren't like necessarily obviously dark, but are, you know, basically portals for energy either going in or coming out that the people who are on the receiving end of don't even know what they mean. And so they're sitting, they're dancing, they're producing a lot of energy, they're vibing, sometimes they're on, a lot of times they're on drugs, and they're basically like at an altar worshiping the geometry of what energy, of the sigil of what entity, um, and sometimes I don't even think the DJs know, you know, it's going on behind the DJs and sometimes the, you know, person doing the visuals and the sound at the show has nothing to do really with the DJ. Um, you know, so I've seen all sorts of interesting stuff. I, you know, obviously we see like a lot of occult symbolism. We also see a lot of things like peace signs and onks and, you know, the genre of like acid house, you'll see a lot of smiley faces and flowers and things like that. But increasing what I, what I've seen like in the major festivals and with the major artist is now uh, what things that like used to be going on in the underground many years ago I think they sort of test things out in the underground and then bring them above ground but also even what I'm seeing in the underground I'm seeing on the screen or on the stage um, what I was seeing behind my eyelids 10 years five or 10 years ago um, and so it's interesting to me like I you know go back and forth on whether what I was seeing behind my eyelids, because I close my eyes when I dance and I see all sorts of, you know, at first it started off with just like kind of fractals and mandalas and it got into really intricate sorts of, you know, uh, geometry, harmonic geometry, sacred geometry. And, you know, sometimes that geometry would almost act as a portal for me to sort of travel through. Um, I've, I've talked about it as psychic time travel before. Like I've found myself remote observing, remote viewing, things like ancient Egypt and the pyramids being built. I mean, I've had numerous different kinds of experiences, including sometimes having visuals about things that I never think about, like, you know, kind of weird looking faces and things that like look, look kind of creepy and not stuff that I'm really into. So what about the music is creating that? And, you know, are they intentionally giving off frequencies that will create geometry that allow entities or energies to come through? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't, um, you know, if you want to go, like, I mean, I'm of the opinion that basically in the underground we're being observed and experimented on with psychotronic weaponry and some of these sound engineers know things about frequencies and whether they're doing it intentionally or not, or they're just being used because they're useful idiots or whatever. Uh, some of them are probably into dark shit as well. Um, some of the visual guys are really, really talented, but like, you know, where, how, like, it's funny to me that like the things I was seeing on my eyelids. 10 years ago, I see now as like the main show on the screen. Like it's very, um, you know, where they, was I was some kind of weaponry or some kind of like artificial intelligence kind of program being run on me or were they, are they, do they have technology where they can observe what's going on in people's minds and then pull that out? Like I, I mean, I'll go far into what I think could be going on here. And 
Um, I think that some of the music, especially some of the, when it's run through like a uh, Beatport technology and MP3 delivery systems, can have um, uh, information, even images, visual images, piggybacked on the sound frequencies, so that when you hear it, you will see something, or when you hear it, you will think something. Um, you know, I like I've considered all that kind of stuff, but yeah, I definitely think the DJ is like you know playing a role. A lot of these really super famous DJs. Um, like some of them aren't even that good, but others like they used to be really good. And then when they got really popular, their music changed and I don't like it as much. And, you know, that's usually the case, right? <laughs> yeah. And their logos. I mean, Mark, Mark does a great job of like, you know, he and I back and forth a lot about this stuff. Um, you know, I contributed to uh, help him with some, you know, some information for, for the tr- dance chapter in his book. And we back and forth a lot about, um, uh, just certain people and the signs and symbols we see. And there's definitely like a focus on, I'd say that the religion of mainstream dance music is definitely transhumanism and futurism. Um, but they don't even know that, you know, like I, what the funny, funny, I mean, and obviously transhumanism is the, is in some ways the religion of the underground as well, though they don't know it. You know, like, I go to these parties that are so like the underground things I go to, they're not the same kind of like altar stage. The DJs are down on the floor generally at the same level, but there'll be like a table from wall to wall, sometimes 30 feet long with different kinds of technological equipment on it, different kinds of drum machines and synthesizers and, you know, just all sorts of technologies for live PAs and hybrid DJ sets and stuff like that. And the way that the, these guys are, it's almost like they have a symbiotic relationship with, the, the machinery and it, it's to me like it's to the point where there's not no longer a border between them and the machine and you know there's probably a question as to whether they're controlling the machine or the machine is controlling them I don't think they see it that way but sometimes every once in a while at a party I'll ask someone I'm chatting with if they know what transhumanism is and none of them have ever heard of it <laughs> yeah that that, Even though they're worshiping it at the, you know, they're basically worshiping at the altar. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really my series in a nutshell, at least towards the end of it, is uh, the indoctrination of of science is actually paralleling occultism, and then, um, you know, all of the transhuman stuff, the twenty forty five avatar project, and everything that they're projecting. It's really mm-hmm. strange because. It's all about this oneness, uniting with the cosmos. It's all about uh, spiritual evolution, even though people don't really think of it that way because, like, technology. But it, it, there's this weird spiritual push to combine these things. And just hearing you just say all these things, it's just, like, reaffirming all that kind of stuff. And it, it is interesting how, um, I, I you know, I, I know a little bit about tarot cards and, and how it relates to, you know, the quote-unquote mystery religion and this kind of reminds me of like the hero fan card where they have this, uh, you know, enlightened figure who's revealing the secrets of the occult, uh, mm-hmm. but, you know, esoterically. And then below him is like the two uh, Gemini twins in, in duality. Like it's the dualistic masses. That's kind of how they view it. You know, the, the twin towers were that before they mm-hmm. unified them into one, just like, you know, their whole all their doctrines and stuff. And so it's just it's interesting with what I've learned about ritual magic and, and sigils. And I haven't gone super deep into a lot of that stuff with like the Crowley things. I, I've read a, a bit about it, but you know, it's, it's all about initiation and bringing people to this quote unquote higher level of consciousness through and all of these different death and resurrections where you destroy your old quote unquote false ego, or your old earthly material nature. And then you, you, you connect to this one truth or this one whatever this oneness i just like kind of say it sarcastically now because it's just no always in your face (laughs) i mean that's i mean in some ways that is exact that process that you described is exactly what the dance music scene is about i mean people go to parties uh, you've heard the term god is a dj right we've all we've heard that term there's t-shirts that say that Uh, you know people go to parties and they have life-changing experiences over the course of one night Right. They sometimes take psychedelics or sometimes the music is powerful enough to just break down all the boundaries for them. And yeah, it, it, I mean, the process of like becoming a raver back in the 90s or getting into underground dance music parties here, it is like an occult initiation. You have to figure out how it works. Like this information, for, I mean, the big festivals, everyone knows about them, but like the more underground kind of stuff and the regular raves back in the day, like you had to figure out how it worked to be able to find the party. Right. 
And then it was like, you know, you took certain kinds of drugs or you listened to certain DJs and like people would refer to the DJ as like, you know, enlightening or as um, just like blowing their mind or opening up their world mm -hmm. or you know, all these things. And you have people sometimes leaving a party in the morning after having stayed up all night. And sometimes people end up, not everybody, like, especially if people are like partying a lot, not in good health and whatever, like there are some people, like now I go to parties and whatever, I take great care of myself. I go, I have a great time, I dance. I sure, I have my own transcendent kind of experiences that is probably different than what other people are having. But people who are not awake and aware, having this kind of stuff, like, and like they're having it over and over. They're almost having like every weekend, like a breakdown of their belief system and a rebuilding of it. Yep, and, exactly. And it's, Freemasonry, it's, building it up, right? That's, that's the, I mean, it totally process. is. And I think <laughs> some of these, I think some of the DJs, I think there's, so I would say this, I think there's like a few of the really big famous DJs that are in on it. And a few of the really underground ones, like because maybe their own personal interests are in the occult or dark magic, they're doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's like a small group of people who are kind of aware of it, but don't really know what it is because they're not researchers or they're not into this other stuff. So they're aware that there's something going on, but they're like playing the game because that seems to be like cool or how you like, you know, progress your career and get in with certain crews and whatever, but also just because it's part of the technology, right? And so like they like the technology, so they're not even willing to consider whether there might be like a downfall, downside to it or something unhealthy about it. And then there's all these people that are going, that go to parties that have no idea what's going on. The other people who I think have a lot of occult knowledge, even if it's not being wielded necessarily in like a bad way or, or intentionally to conform to an agenda, but sometimes things end up getting worked through them, are the sound and light, the sound engineers and the people who do visuals, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think they have in some ways as much or more control than the DJ, um, you know, and some of the people throwing events. I mean, I have noticed there to be occult significance of the dates and names of some of the parties, the location, they're in interesting places sometimes. I've noticed that like in certain rooms, I'm able to have certain kinds of transcendent experiences and others not so much. And if, if I'm able to have them, I'm aware of that I'm having them, but what's happening to people who don't really know what's going on and how these things can happen. So it's almost like, this is what I say, like, par like parties are portals. They're a celebration of the sacred geometry of space, time, and sound. Yeah. And then, you know, take that to, to Burning Man, which is all held in this gigantic Pentagon, basically. Right. And um, I, I just thought it was really interesting uh, hearing somebody like Elon Musk saying Burning Man is Silicon Valley. Like this is all stuff that I'm just finding out about within the last year. Cause like I said, I'm not really, I didn't even know what Burning Man was. I'd, I'd heard of it. I thought it was like Lollapalooza or something. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I didn't yeah. know like what was the the deal with it. And, and then it's all these like big tech names that attend and it's almost like spirituality for Silicon Valley or for technology like science minded people, it, right? And that's exactly what the occult is and based on my own series. <laughs> yeah. So I'll take it one step further than Elon Musk though, and I'll say that Burning Man is Westworld. I haven't seen that. That's a show, right? Yeah, it's a show. And I so when I first started watching it, like I I have still haven't been able to watch it all the way through because it brings up a lot of things for me because we're dealing with underground bases and cloning and all sorts of stuff. And these are things that are like present in some of the reality that I that I deal with and it's sometimes hard, certain, sometimes it's easy to watch, sometimes it's hard. But the very first thing I understood when I first started watching Westworld, I was like, all I thought about was Burning Man. And so I said that on a podcast of ours over the summer. And then again, when I was on Truth Frequency Radio just a few months back, um, and like, people, I, I think first, I, at first people thought I was like meaning it like figuratively, but no, I mean it literally. And somebody even went and looked and found that the logo for Westworld looks exactly like Burning Man from up above. Like they take a picture of Burning Man from up above. It's exactly the same as the Westworld logo. Mm. And I think that Burning Man is celebrating all of the things we've talked about. But I also think what's really going on there is that the people are partying with people that aren't really people. I think that there's like, all. Oh, I think there's <laughs> things going on with cloning and with, you know, cyborg. And obviously people have talked about like other kinds of entities and energies there, but one of the things you notice about Burning Man is a lot of people there wear costumes and masks. And when someone's wearing a costume or a mask, you can't really look at them the same way. If you have a mask, like the, the, the theme this past year was masks. It's 120 fucking degrees there. Who the hell would want to wear a mask? <laughs> it's like, like a giant eyes wide shut party. 
That's exactly <laughs> that's what I'm saying. But you also can't see someone's eyes, mm-hmm. right? And so you're there and you're in a, a very like diminished state because it's hot, you're thirsty, you're not really eating or sleeping properly while you're there, you're likely on drugs. Um, if something seems funny to you, you're likely just to chalk it up to one of those reasons instead of investigating what else might really be going on there. Mm-hmm. And um, Wi-Fi is now available there. Uh, it's on government land. They have uh, a, a, their own airspace and restricted airspace area around it. With the involvement of all of the technolog- technology companies. It's out in the middle of nowhere. So like there's a freedom to do things there that there isn't, you know, like it's not, there's no in- other interrupting kinds of frequencies and things like that. Um, you know, I think, the the theme this year for Burning Man is iRobot. So they're telling you. It, 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 it's not a secret. Mm-hmm. I mean, the whole thing with Westworld is that they're basically like uh, cyborgs or like um, they call them hosts. Like they're like basically, bo- you know, like computerized bodies that ho- you know run programs. Um, and, you know, it's the idea that some of them can sort of start to have feelings and come to life and that the amusement park that is Westworld isn't actually for the visitors, but it's for these these hosts. It's for these sort of clone cyborg robotic, you know, human robotoids kinds of things. Hmm. And I think that is very likely what is going on at Burning Man. Yeah, and if it's all about you know tapping into this oneness thing, it's it's like you you kind of lose your identity in that. Ironically, yeah. it's like about you know it's supposed to be about expanding beyond borders, just like you know the whole. Uh, uh, Uranus and, and Neptune, you know, breaking free of Saturnian limitations and, and boundaries. And but it's all done in this controlled environment, which is really ironic, I think. <laughs> it's totally controlled. I mean, like the idea that you're free on government land is hilarious. But yeah. like, you know, that should have been the first clue to anybody a long time ago. Um, but also uh, the creation of a hive mind. If you notice, if you have any friends that have like or if you ever meet people that have gone to Burning Man, like They'll go to Burning Man and they'll come back like dressed like all the other people who've been to Burning Man with the same like purpley, blue, you know, whatever hair and with a little vial of sand from the desert around their neck and mm-hmm. talking about the same stuff. And they're definitely creating a hive mind up there. It's and because because they're doing weird stuff that seems unique to the outside world, people don't think of them as being assimilated. They think of them as being unique individuals. But pretty much like there's, I mean, literally, I could like think of. Like I could go to any party here and like there's like a hundred girls that look exactly the same and they all went to Burning Man last summer. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, you know, so, and again, like I know there's a lot, I've never been at this point just because of the things that I've you know been involved in and talked about, I probably wouldn't even be safe for me to go. I don't know if I want, you know, I know there's a lot of things there I would love. There's incredible art there. There's really good music. There's really good DJs. Yeah, but, it's not that we don't want to paint a picture of like it's all yeah. evil or something, but just that there's something else going the on involved, there that right, no one think, really knows about. <laughs> I think most of the people involved there are in it because like they're, they think they're doing exactly what they're doing, and they're not understanding that like Tavistock is there, and all of Silicon Valley is there, and the CIA is there, and the FBI is there, and you know, like they're they're. I mean, like the FBI and the CIA were requesting trailers there like a couple years ago and burning man made this big thing about like turning it down but like that i think that was like the probably of, stage just to make stage. it seem like exactly. they were That's rebelling what I, yeah you know especially <laughs> when you have someone like steve outram starting uh, steve outram's stuff that he's done with the honor of is great maybe hopefully one day i'll get to to talk to him um his observations are interesting he comes at it from a totally different perspective than i do but like some of the things he said certainly validate stuff i mean he had that one session he did with Jan Irvin where they were talking about like the questionnaire that was like asking all these questions about how you identify gender wise and whatever. Why the fuck does that matter? Yeah, exactly. It's a party. Why do you need to fill out a survey about where you stand on your own personal gender fluidity at that, you know, both before attending the festival and after? Like, that's, <laughs> like, yeah, that's really weird. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden I, I went to Burning Man. I want to change my gender. <laughs> um, well, yeah. the other thing you I've heard you talk about, I don't know if this happens at Burning Man, but you've mentioned uh, like ele- electronic tracking or some sort of technology mm. that's like surveillance for people that are at these quote unquote expanding consciousness events and like liberating sure. events. Yeah. So um, uh, the, okay. So the first thing like with that is uh, that a lot, a lot, a lot of times people buy tickets through these like online ticketing agencies. Right. So mm. like, like the, the like um, there used to be that like this SFX or SDX, company owned like a lot of festivals and they owned a ticketing service and they own 
like the they own Beatport and they own the merchandising thing. So they were like controlling the experience from start to finish. So that like from the first from the very first time you started researching how much tickets cost and if you wanted to go, then they could follow you from that point all the way through attending the festival, li listening to the music there. They're running stuff through their own Beatport technology. Whatever things you buy, whatever clothes you buy there or shirts or whatever that has sigils from it on there. And then the comments you make online afterwards about the experience, it's like controlled from start to finish. But also, and I noticed this first, like many, many years back, because I lived in Austin for a long time in South by Southwest, which is not an electronic music festival. And there is electronic music there, but it's for um, many different kinds of music. They started using wristbands with RFID chips in it. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting. That was like, I'm like, I'm not going this year. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and then I started noticing that they're starting, they started doing this at a lot of these bigger festivals that they um they give out an rfid chip and also of course it's for your own protection in case you get taken or lost right <laughs> i like I, I well some of them they you know it's you can like charge up on them so that you don't have to bring cash in you can like chart you can basically like have a charge account on your RFID oh, okay so chip. it's more monetary kind of thing it's like well it's both i mean I, I i don't i mean i think the idea is they're saying it's for so you don't have to carry things around money oh, around gotcha, whatever. Yeah. but what it's really for is tracking you know what i mean like in my opinion, like, I don't, like, I, I'm not a dog. I don't need a chip. Like, I can keep my money in my pocket. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it, it's kind of ridiculous. But it's also, like, a lot of these, play, like, I don't like, like, I like to pay, go to parties. I like to pay cash at the door. I don't like buying tickets online and, and GPSing how to get to the party. Like, literally, like, if, if I'm right and there's people at parties who have been through programs and whatever and, it's, it's for, if for some of us, these are actually, they're actually probably calling us to these locations. Like my friend, Chris Taylor, who's an energy healer. We were having a conversation one time about, well, if you have people that you want to bring to a certain location, because that's a, there's like an energetic vortex there. You want to have some kind of energetic ritual. You want to, you know, expose them to certain kind of stimulus and see how they react, especially if they're, you know, then you, create a party there that you know that they would be drawn to. Like some of the places that I go to parties, they're the fucking weirdest places. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you remember like about like a year and a half ago, there was like a fire at some place called the ghost ship warehouse in Oakland. No. Uh, okay. Yeah. And that place was like full of all sorts of weird, like occult shit. And there was like, there was, there was something on going on there on like a multi interdimensional level. Mm -hmm. Like there was so many weird things about that. But what's funny is, this party that I went to here a few months before that, and I didn't know this at that time, but when there was that same party this year at that same place, I found out that this part, this place that it was at was called the Ghost Collective. So I'm assuming that they're related, that they're maybe like part of the same collective or run by the same people. And this pl the place is fucking weird. I mean, like the party is amazing. And I, I had, you know, like music was amazing. The visuals were amazing. I enjoyed, I really enjoyed myself. And but I also made a lot of observations. And one of the observations I made is that there was energy running through that building that I'm not sure other people were picking up on that was affecting the way people were behaving. Like I felt like there was a portal and like weird shit was blowing through the party. I mean, and there was, you know, I'm starting to really look into the use of LED lights for mind control. Um, we already know about sound and cymatics and things like that. Um, you know, but there is, you know, a really weird, and Mark is so great at like documenting how the uh, Summer of Love in the 60s relates to acid house music, which gave birth to electronic dance music. And the acid house scene in London has a very, very strong connection, almost, almost like a time portal, like a time travel connection, like between like the late, uh, the, the late 80s and early 90s in London to what goes on in the underground in Los Angeles now, because the underground here, like acid house and tech house and certain kinds of techno that are techno music, but that are in sort of inspired in some ways by those, those early acid kinds of scenes. Like when I'm there, it's like almost like you can see, like it's like, um, like a pipeline, like an energetic pipeline. And it's channeling the same kind of like energies. And there was definitely, you know, I, like I hate to say it because it's, you know, like I, you know, I, I would just wish I could have something that I can, could enjoy just for exactly what it was. And, not know all this other stuff, but on the other hand, I'm glad I do. <laughs> this shit has Tavistock written all over it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, like, you know, I've been at parties where it felt to me, like this one particular party I'm thinking of, 
where I had the feeling, the intuitive hit, the download, that like every person that was in that room was a person like me, was like probably some kind of like, you know, mind control subject or some kind of like um, unknown to their own self, some kind of operative or whatever. And it's almost like some of these parties are reunions for us. Mm -hmm. And to see what happens when we get together and exposed to certain kinds of sounds and frequencies and see what kind of like energetic signature or energetic like build build up of energy can be created you know what i mean and you know that there's like entities and energies that love to feast on that kind of stuff you know what i mean yeah i definitely and i'm i'm one of these people where i definitely feel that and i don't um i never did any hard drugs i just smoked pot and i did mushrooms a few times and um i was at the university of vermont and they had this big thing on 420 and like they have it had this big drum circle and all this stuff. And this is sort of my relationship to all this stuff. I remember going to it and I was just like terrified. Not, it was just like a feeling like I'm looking around and it mm-hmm. was just really creepy, like watching everybody stoned out of their minds, just like drumming. Where was they, or everyone's like, you know, everyone's talking about as this awesome experience. And I'm just like looking around, I'm like, oh my God, get me out of here. I want to go play ultimate Frisbee somewhere. <laughs> and like, that was my one connection to the, the quote unquote hippies, like a hacky sack and ultimate Frisbee. But um, it was just like, I, I don't know, like what you were kind of talking about too, uh, earlier when we, when we talked about like seeing something and, and then having a level of discernment for yourself by by seeing how something is, you know, there's something wrong with it, and that actually is helpful for you to be like, okay, I definitely don't want to be part of this. And that was like really, I have a weird relationship with like big festivals and concerts and stuff. Even bands that I go, I like to go see, I always yeah. never felt comfortable at concerts. I always yep. I always felt like I would see this. I don't want to be mean, but like the sheeple behavior. And, and I could, you know, like a, a band that I I love is Tool, but I remember going to a Tool concert mm-hmm. and I was just like, I don't know, just hearing the way people talk and stuff. It's like it was yeah. obvious that they liked the music for way different reasons than I liked it. Yep. And um, it's almost like they you deify something to this level that I don't think is is reality or it is. And yeah. that's that's what always turns me off um, w- with any of these sorts of things when I'm like, you know, I'm like. I'm sorry, but people are acting like this is way greater than it actually is. And I need to get the fuck out. And hey, if you guys want to keep doing it and you have fun with it, fine. But this is not for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I so I agree. I don't like big festivals. Um, I had I had some like scary experiences at like festivals and parties where like there were so many people there and like it would be like um, like so crowded and people would be like so not conscious of what's going on around them that I would actually get pinned between people at, with my feet off of the floor. I'm very, very small. And it was like, I couldn't even like move. It was like my feet weren't touching the floor and I'm pinned between people. And so since then, like that, that was like things that would happen like back at the raves in the nineties. I never liked, I don't like going to places where it's too jam packed or too claustrophobic. That's why like, I prefer to go to these smaller warehouse parties where like, I have a little bit of room to dance and there's maybe just a couple hundred people there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know exactly what you're talking about, and I'll say this: that the the feel of the tool of tool music is very similar to the feel of the underground warehouse scene in Los Angeles. And yeah, like I don't I I don't know if the people who are around me at parties. I have a few friends I go to parties with here, but it's like I said, for me, it's a mostly solitary experience. So I'm doing my own thing. Like I usually just go off in the corner and dance by myself. And, and people sometimes you like I tried to say hi, but your eyes were closed and you didn't even you see, <laughs> see that I was there. So I kind of because I love the music so much and I really love dancing and I, I wouldn't be here talking to you and have figured a lot of this stuff out and, and if I didn't have that. And so for me, it's an important part of my life, but I had to really make it like I do my thing kind of separate from everybody else. Like every once in a while, I'll go to a party where like the vibe feels right for me and I'm a little more interactive with people. But sometimes I go to parties and if it feels strange to me, I just leave. Mm-hmm. Even, like, you know, sometimes even if the music like, I, this music, like, sometimes even if it's music I like, if there's like a certain kind of, vibe or energy for me like I go to a party if I'm not into it in the first hour when I say into it I mean it feels like okay like like not like spiritually dangerous for me to be there you know what I mean yeah um, I mean and I can't say sometimes I've stayed when it's a little spiritually dangerous but and sometimes you have interesting experiences but I'm very cautious like I'm aware of that and I'm kind of constantly monitoring what's going on around me and my own thoughts and 
um, you know, the idea of just being able to lose yourself in the music is like is not safe these days, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's very interesting going to parties because like I don't really do it much anymore. When I was younger, I was definitely like in the party scene. But on my own terms, I wasn't like, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, I guess we can transition to I wanted to talk about kind of like the role of drugs in all yeah. of this. And, you know, it's sort of for me, I, I guess uh, my experience a lot of times, especially with with smoking pot, was way different than how I observed other people, how they talked about it. And that was yeah. always something that was very strange to me. And, and for me personally, one of them was I remember it's like you hear people talk about something and you just you you, you know where they got it from. It's like almost like whenever I would smoke pot with people, they acted like people did in the movie Half Baked because they think that that's how you're supposed to <laughs> act when you smoke pot. It's like right. you could see their program to do something. And I didn't like whenever I don't sense individuality in people, yeah. uh, I, I, I and I, I sense that they're kind of saying things that I just intuitively I'm like, I, I just feel like they're repeating that verbatim from something. And it's it's not like I'm, I'm being mean about it. It's just like I want people's individual nature to come out. And that's why whenever I would drink, at least when I first started drinking, if I got in those situations where I felt like a good vibe where I was, I felt like I was somebody who could like bring that out in people and let them be more of who they were rather than this program thing. Because when I felt that way, that's kind of like how I wanted other people to be. And I think that that naturally happens. But unfortunately, I think when people get in these situations with, with, with partying and whatnot, it, it's like, it's so hard to get that vibe there. And it's like, you know, like for me, I remember going to a bar. I love going to bars on like Tuesday nights at eight o'clock with like a group of like five to 10 friends because you can kind of like build the vibe up for the night. And I think yeah. that you what you were talking about with people being attracted and going to different places and whatnot. I think that you will actually naturally attract people that would actually be conducive to what you've built there versus if you walk in at 11 o'clock and it's packed and it's like I immediately hits me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, holy shit, like it's crazy in here and I am not having fun and everyone's screaming out sweet Caroline, like bomb, bomb, bomb. <laughs> like, dude, how many fucking times we got to do this? Like, there's no individuality. Everyone just like joins this big yeah. pool of, you know, <laughs> oneness. Right. But it's just a bunch of bullshit. And I'm just like, I, I can't be here. And so that's kind of my experience with it. But for you, you've talked a little bit about your own personal experience. How, how do you view, how have you viewed other people when they're taking drugs and stuff like that? What are some things that stand out to you in observing other people? Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously the drug that is, like, associated most with dance music is ecstasy, and I played with that a little bit when I first got into it, but it never, it wasn't my thing. It was, it's a, like, it was kind of, like, it, I, I sure, I understand, like, there is that feeling of, like, oh, I love everybody, and it just felt fake to me, and I would watch people, like, be super nice when they're on drugs and then act like assholes the rest of the time, or, like, just... I don't know. It just also made me want to sit down and I like to dance. And so that was kind of like a no for me. Um, but yeah, like I watch people, um, yeah, act like super different. And what I've also noticed is like a lot of times if you're not doing the same drugs that they're doing, like they want nothing to kind of do with you. Like the people who, you know what I mean? Like they want to hang out with other people who are in that same spot. And I've gone through many periods of time in my partying years where I've been totally sober. You know, I, I you know, I like psychedelics. I enjoy the psychedelic experience. And I think it's actually been, uh, expansive for me in a lot of ways but I don't think it's something that needs to be done all the time and in every situation so the ecstasy thing yeah like it's annoying like I you know like it is and I like it's kind of gross to me when I see like you know for at this point I'm 42 and a lot of people that I go to that are at the parties I go to are in their 30s and 40s and some older and when they're like still sort of acting the way that like we acted when we were in our 20s and we were doing it you know what I mean like it's kind of it's yeah know, they never I, I grow up I think it's totally fine to do it if you can have like a mature internal experience. But like to me, that's what psychedelics are for, for like an expansive internal experience. And sometimes you can vibe with somebody. Sometimes you can, you know, have a trip with somebody where you're kind of like mind melding in a cool way. And that can be good. But like I see all sorts of weird stuff. Like, obviously, there's also acid, m mushrooms, ketamine, all sorts of other weird designer drugs that like I don't even know what they're called anymore because I'm so far out of the loop. There isn't really use of things like DMT and ayahuasca, obviously at parties, but a lot of people who are into dance music are doing those things. Um, 
And so, yeah, like, I mean, you can tell, like, there's a lot of people who've, like, watched a lot of Terrence McKenna videos, and so then when they trip, they see the self-transforming machine elves, and you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I'm, like, pretty glad, like, I started having psychedelic experiences before I really knew about any of that stuff, and so I kind of had my own baseline for the experience, and, like, I have my own ways of kind of, like, checking and knowing that this is, like, an, uh, my kind of experience as opposed to something that's being dictated by something else. I mean, to the extent that you can do that. Obviously, anytime you're on any kind of mind altering drug, like you're open to influences, you know, other influences, but like you have to like develop a baseline with yourself and like know yourself in a certain way. And what really disturbs me is like when I see people behaving in ways that they would never normally behave, whether it's like someone who's normally outgoing is just like suddenly shriveled and quiet in a corner or someone who's usually kind of introverted is like, you know, screaming and starting fights with people. And then there's, like, obviously the whole sexual thing where, like, one of the things I noticed really early on with ecstasy was that, like, like I would see I, – I have absolutely no problem with anyone who's gay, bi, transgender, gender fluid, experimenting, all of that kind of stuff. But it does bother me when that only hap- – I see that happening when people are on drugs and only then. And I noticed really early on that, like, I'd see people – kissing people of the same, you know, we see like girls kissing each other at parties who are not gay, who are not lesbians. You'd see guys making out and then like the next day they deny it kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this, like, if you're, I I mean, everything, every like thought or feeling that I've ever had, like on a psychedelic, like is still something that is in like my, my realm, right? It might be something I've never thought of before and it opened my mind to something, but it's not like it's something that like, oh, I would never think about. You that have ever. your own borders that you're able yeah. to maintain, whereas some people just all of a sudden that just completely goes the, away. The, the only borders that come down for me in psychedelic experiences are the borders like within myself, getting to know like other levels of myself, like connecting with, you know, my future self, my past self, different layers within myself. It never like, has anything to do with how I relate to another person. You know what I mean? Like it's not... Um, like I've never been like somebody who like I looked at one way before. Then I when I was on drugs, I was like, oh, suddenly I want to like make out with this person. You know, like, it's yeah. just it's it's <laughs> disturbing. And you know, like I've watched this happen. Um, you know, that was like a big thing when I first started going to raves, and then I saw less of that through a period of time. And then like all of a sudden now, like I'm having this experience. I go to way less parties than I used to just because I don't have time. Like I you know, work full time and I do the show and I have a bunch of other little things I'm working on on the side. So I only ever get to go out like once every couple months now. And I'll stay out like all night. Like I love to dance for hours and hours and hours, but I do a lot of observing. I'll dance for a couple hours and then I'll go sit down and sort of watch the room and kind of uh, debrief myself on my own thoughts to make sure I'm not picking up programming and whatever. And I've noticed that like the amount of androgyny I'm seeing at parties and it's not, it doesn't feel natural to me. Like I remember like for years and years in the party scene in Los Angeles, it was mostly like a lot of dudes, like a lot more dudes than women. And like a lot of, there's a lot of Latino and Asian people here that's like an organic part of the scene here. Um, but it was like, I'd say mostly straight people. Like there is some crossover between like circuit parties and like, like, you know, like that kind of thing. So it's, you'd have some like gay guys and whatever, but it was not like a big gay thing. And like the last party I went to, it was like, Everybody, like every, I was like in line for the porta porta potties, and like everybody, like was talking. You know, the girls were all talking about their girlfriends, and you know, it, it was like weird. It was like so, like super gay, which I don't have a problem with it, but it was like, it was like it bizarre. just felt unnatural. It felt unnatural. <laughs> it's like not not like it's like it was unnaturally gay. It wasn't like I know gay people, but these aren't them. It's kind of weird. <laughs> gay, and there was like a lot of people there that like. I had a hard time telling if they were male or female. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't have a problem with that except for the fact that it was so many of them. And like, you know, like it was very, um, it almost felt more Android-ish. And so to me, I often wonder if the combination of a lot of these drugs, which I think, like, I think a lot of these drugs cause like rise in estrogen or cause some kind of feminization of a lot of men. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know so much what the hormonal aspects are on a woman, but like, I also like wonder if like the frequencies in combination, like the technology and like, I mean, when you're in these, like a lot of these people are also like working in the computer industry, like a lot of DJs and a lot of people who like go to parties and are into this kind of stuff. Like they work in technology. A lot of them have themselves or their spouse or their significant others, like work for companies like Raytheon or Northrop Grumman. A lot of, like a lot of the DJs 
and stuff like that. They have they work for those kinds of companies in their day job and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. So like they're around technology all the time. They're like there's this like symbiotic relationship with it. You're exposed to all these frequencies. You're doing these drugs. I'm just wondering if we're like if it's a multi-leveled attack to turn people into like physical androids. You know what I mean? And when I say that, like I don't I don't have any problem with androgyny. Like I, I actually if it's organic, I actually think that like in some ways androgyny can be a very high spiritual place. But I'm not talking about it from a physical aspect. I'm talking about it like inner androgyny being a person like having really good um, connection between their right and left brain, like ha being like balanced between their male and female characteristics. Yeah, right? like a guy who can be a guy, but still talk about his feelings and not feel weird about her cry and things like that. And, you know? and a girl who can, you know, compartmentalize her feelings to get a job done with like there is, I mean, in some ways, like I think that there, that is so much of what the agenda is about is that like taking people like, you know, I don't know if it's because of, the spot, the spot, the spot we're at in time, our evolution, or where we're going through in the supposed galaxy, or what program we're running in the simulation. But there's a, a lot of people like coming online and becoming empowered. And part of being empowered is being balanced. And Mark Passio is someone who's like great on this, right? Having balance between your right and left brain, having balance between your male aspects and your female aspects, and that's an internal thing. And we know that like it's the human tendency sometimes to externalize things instead of internalize them because internalizing them is a little bit harder and like can be more confusing and take more time to work through. And so people who are trying to control the development or the evolution or the waking up of the human of humanity would take the, this opportunity to manipulate it into an outer phenomenon. And I think that's what we're seeing with like the transgender agenda is that like instead of, I mean, it can be a massively empowering experience to deal with your inner oppositional thoughts. Right, like like we talked about in the beginning, being able to hold two opposing thoughts, ideas, feelings in your mind at the same time, is a sign of like intellect, sp spiritual awareness, maturity, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you can get someone to like freak out and think it's all about like what their appendages are or like you know whatever, and and not have the internal process, instead externalize it and use that as like something to divide themselves from other people or to like turn into some kind of like identity politics kind of thing. It's like the biggest like manipulation and retardation of the human spirit ever. Yeah, I yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with that where it's like it's like the rebel without a cause where they want to rebel against something and so they see people they you get the, it's ironic, you get the visual of looking unique and so now like uh, something that would obviously be breaking the norm would be looking at somebody who you can't tell if they're male or female or something like that. It's it's more of a visual it's thing. It's not even unique anymore now. Like, right, right. People look like that. So and and like, ironically, it's 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 being sold as like being more spiritual in a way with all this stuff, but you're actually attaching it to a physical thing, which is weird. And so to me, it's just like there is obviously an agenda here, and that's probably the elephant in the room with a lot of these things because everyone's afraid to at least discuss it because you're going to be pegged as a bigot or something like that. And it's just like. Well, dude, there's something going on here. It's really weird. And then when you read all these esoteric doctrines about, you know, again, I, th this is something I've talked about before in some other shows with the, the root race cycle uh, of, of, quote unquote, human evolution from the eyes of the occultists or theosophists and whatever. It, it, it's like humanity moves down in, into the Kali Yuga, into this degradation, and apparently male and female sexual reproduction is associated with that. And then going up to the divinity is androgynous and it's going up into bisexuality and up into androgyny and that's seen as a spiritual evolution from that root race cycle and this root race cycle is apparently only for the adepts and they don't let the masses know about it but i think they're they're letting the masses know about it now because it's really but fully kicking into gear and it's all to me headed towards this transhumanism way. but yeah. it's in a retarded way like exactly. I, I, I agree in a certain sense that like with your spiritual advancement comes more like a level of inner androgyny, like a level of learning to deal with and balance your characteristics and and in some ways being open-minded to certain possibilities you weren't uh, before. But if you can get people to turn it into this like weird, like nonsense version of that, mm -hmm. then while you, while the people who are doing it are doing the, the genuine form of it, right? You're the, like, it's weird. And the, the transhuman, I think the transgender agenda is part of the transhumanist agenda. It's getting people to 
it's uh, loosening people up to the idea that like you know your body is something to be like manipulated operated on played with have things taken off put on yeah. put in um you know taking certain kinds of like drugs that will change your body uh, i mean it's it's definitely i mean it's you know, it's just kind of lazy in a way. It's just like, oh, I'm just going to wait till technology advances so I can just hop my consciousness into something and be whatever I want. <laughs> it's, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, to, it's, I mean, it's totally lazy. And it also just leaves people like wide open to, I mean, to all sorts of stuff. Like, you know, like, like you don't know, that, like if you're thinking that's going like, to, we don't know what's actually going to happen when that happens. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, like I'll, 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 like bank on like sticking with my own consciousness and my own mind and my own body rather than like taking that, that chance. You know what I mean? Like, oh, for sure. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just think the, um, this, uh, the, uh, this, the electronic dance music scene and particularly some of this, you know, culture that's been born out of it with things like burning men and whatever is the absolutely perfect, um, like group to experiment with this on because these are people open to the idea of a loose relationship to their sexuality, open to the idea of, of um, being bonded in many ways with technology, having a symbiotic, I mean, when you're using technology to produce your music and you feel like, you know, like you play guitar, I've heard you talk about it, you have that moment where you feel one with the guitar, right? But the mm -hmm. guitar is an inanimate object that other than the vibration it's passing back to you, it's not picking up information on you and passing other information back to you. The computer is, right? The computer is. And especially, you know, when you're dealing with a computer using things that involve Bluetooth technology and certain sorts of um, sound frequency technology, it's just, you know, it's like, it's almost like shooting something into you intravenously. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah not to mention, good. I mean, this isn't to like, you know, poo poo like skill level in like electronic music, but my God, it takes so many hours to learn an actual instrument. It's just like insane. And so it's just like, I don't know. To me, I, I always go for like, uh, you, I always was attracted to like the, 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 the process of like, I liked uh, hip hop bands that like play their own instruments. Like, like I like like the roots yeah. and whatever. I went to see them in concert and I was like, this is pretty badass. Like they're, they, their drummer's awesome. Their bass, like they, it just made it, better for me but that's what i identify with and i don't like i'm not one of these snobs about it where if like other people like whatever they're going to do is whatever they're going to do but i've always been more attracted to like the instrumental part of things i guess like the actual yeah. physical connection of a human being playing something i'll say this there are some djs and like perform you know producers and performance artists and whatever out there with electronic music that are extremely skilled that that you know obviously like you know, a lot of us who've been around a long time prefer the, the sound and the experience of vinyl records being played. Um, and then, you know, some of the most interesting stuff is when you have people doing hybrid sets where they're playing vinyl records, but they're also using some of the more technological aspects. Some of these people are have really spent years and years becoming proficient at it. Others just use, you know, the technology that basically like cues shit up for you and, you know, match, beat matches for you and, you know, is basically just like you're programming it to do what you want, but you're not necessarily exercising any skills. I mean, a lot of there's a lot of DJs out there who are really, really skilled. It's like DJ and, Paris Hilton, right? <laughs> that, that's just, there should not. Yeah, right. So it's almost like just like karaoke, but with electronic. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So I mean, I, obviously, dance electronic music is the music I love the most, and I do think there is the poss It has the potential for deep, deep inner understanding and spiritual experiences, and that's why they're exploiting it. Like if it was just dumb, then like they probably wouldn't pay any attention to it. I've had some of the most incredible experiences with electronic music because I mean we know all about like you can use sound heal for f healing for frequency you know frequencies for healing now you can use them for transcendent experiences and they know that and so they're distorting it to try and control what that would be you know what I mean like I think it is inevitable in some ways that like you know technology will be part of our advancement and part of our future, even in some sort of a spiritual way. But the point is, is that our spiritual development has to be at the same or higher level as our technological advancement. Because if you let the technological take over, then it will start to like eat over into that spirit. They have to be separate. They can come together. Like you can have a spiritual experience that involves technology, but you can't have your spiritual experience dictated by the technology. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's, it's that same thing with like being in the, the truther world where we're, 
we're bitching about technology, but then we're connecting through it. So it's it's finding that balance yeah. like you were talking about and just yeah. allowing it to help you and then rather than you becoming enslaved to it. And unfortunately, when you look around and see everybody buried in their cell phones, and it's not like I'm not guilty of doing that at times, but it's just like, oh, God, like, you know, it's it's everywhere. But um, well, speaking of like this, this idea of like tapping into scenes or, or like, uh, you know, trying to manipulate uh, kind of like a counterculture as a whole. What do you think about the parallels between, you know, the whole 1960s counterculture and then the electronic dance music scene with like the drugs and expanding consciousness vibe? Yeah, I think it's an exact, like they're basically, it's an updated version. Um, it's an updated version with like a lot better technology, obviously. And also with the, like uh, the advance in like globalism. Right. Like, so basically when, you know, obviously there was some in the sixties, like there was some back and forth between basically like the UK and the United States and whatever, um, dance music is global. And it's like, you know, um, it like, dan- <laughs> like I had this funny thought the other day that like soccer and electronic music are like the two are, are perfect tools of globalism. Right. <laughs> All the other sports are like more associated with like, you know, like football's an American thing, baseball's an American thing, right? All that kind of stuff. But they're really pushing soccer hard the same way EDM has been pushed really hard. And I consider EDM a little different. Like the, I, the music that I'm really into is like house and techno, it's underground. EDM is the stuff that you, I mean, even though like theoretically in some ways you can say they're part of the same thing, the shit that you see at these enormous festivals or in these huge concert halls or, you know, like when the, the DJs are, you know, like are as famous as pop stars and whatever, it's a global, it's a global phenomenon. If you go and look back, and Mark does a really good job at documenting this in, in his new book. Like it's basically like from the very beginning, the like radio shows were called like global dance party. Global, it was music created to help push globalism. I mean, you can go like I've seen this. I've seen people at parties who don't speak the same language just standing there and like vibing to the music together and, you know, thinking they're having a unifying experience. And in some cases, likely they probably are, but they're also often on a lot of drugs and under these conditions that we've spoken about and possibly having a hive mind experience and whatever. It's definitely music that like, it's transnational, it's global. Like the same, like, you know, like the same, uh, like there's people who like the same techno music that I like in cities all over the world. They have their underground parties, like the ones I go to. LA is a particularly a hotbed, but it's not a music that's particular to like, you know, country music is particularly American, right? Like um, certain th- you know, certain other kinds of music are particularly thought of as being, you know, the domain of, you know, one part of the world or another. Um, this music is totally global and is, you know, people travel all over the world to attend festivals and parties and what, and whatnot. And so, yeah, and yeah, I never I really thought about it that way because I I don't know a whole lot about it, but it's, it, it's, you're right. <laughs> yeah, glo- like look at like the names of half of like radio shows. It's like Global Dance Party, Global Global EDM. Glo- I mean, there's a bunch of it in Mark's book, and then you know these DJs are constantly on tour, going all over the world. Um, you know, so they're almost like ambassadors of the music as opposed to of their country. But yeah, the whole expanding consciousness thing. I mean, literally, like it, it, that's. I mean, I think the best like Burning Man and Woodstock are like very like the same kind of thing. Right. And you're seeing like, it's a different kind of like the people who went to like Woodstock and all those music festivals in like the sixties and you know, all the stuff that Dave McGowan talks about, and you know, weird scenes in the Canyon and whatever, like they basically, it, it made them, you know, instead of being anti-war activists, they just got into like eating acid and having sex with everybody. And like, you know, they thought they were like, you know, practicing free love that would save the world, but really they were just like not paying attention to what was going on. And I see the same thing in dance music. Like these people are, they go to parties and they have, they're very technologically aware and they're like, you know, masters of using social media and stuff like that. But I'll just tell you this right now. Like one of the things I find really disturbing about my own scene is these people have no idea what's really going on. Like I, I know one or two other people in the dance music scene here in Los Angeles and maybe three or four people and all of my friends that listen to dance music that are aware of any of the kind of information you are aware of at all. Mm-hmm. Most of the people like they're, you know, they were like mad that Hillary didn't win 
or if they didn't like Hillary, they thought Bernie was a great was great for sure. Like they believe all the like it's 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 scary. You know what I mean? Like it's like I sometimes think that like if people at the parties I go to knew what was in my head and what I was thinking about while I was there, they I, they'd probably, they'd probably <laughs> attack me. You know what I mean? Like these people are asleep, and it's not because they're stupid. These are creative people. These are smart people. Some of them are great artists. Some of them have truly unique personalities. But you know, I don't know what why it is that like I simultaneously with being interested in this music also went down this other path and thank God I or think, I mean, I'm not a religious person, but thank goodness I did because uh, otherwise I'd be just as lost as most of these people are. Like they really, um, like I, I'm sorry, but I find it really disturbing if anybody thinks that like Hillary Clinton was, would have been any kind of solution to the problem that we're in now. <laughs> and you know, like I guarantee you that like most of the people who go to these, like who's an into dancing music are really pretty far left. You know what I mean? There, there's a few that are like libertarian or Republican or whatever, but they're the kind that are mostly interested in money or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or whatever, like that kind of thing. Um, like I don't, like, you'd think like the whole idea of the move of dance music and the acid house scene and, the, and, and that stuff back in the sixties was to question authority. I don't see any of these people questioning authority. I see them questioning anybody who actually says anything that makes sense, but not actually questioning authority. How, like, what kind of counterculture movement like plays into the agenda of the people that they're trying to oppose? Yeah. And that's really, to me, one thing that the, the, the controlling forces are so good at. And that's what I've learned. Uh, I guess, you know, you kind of always see this, but I, I, I've learned about it a lot more in depth through reading all of these occult doctrines that, you know, it, it's, it's this polarity game. They like to play both sides. They have the good cop and the bad cop. So they create this, war or oppressive regime like you know in the 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 60s and the war and stuff like that and then more modern day it's like the bush cheney warmongering types and then they incite that through the media and then also there's this they like to try to attach that to you know traditional family values because they you know people see this conservative label and they're like oh that's like you know family values patriarchy you know that's all outdated and so then this solution that's offered is this counterculture protest that's allegedly breaking free from these, you know, Saturnian institutions of restriction, but then they're all controlled by the government, but nobody really knows. Or when, when it comes out that it is, it's like in your face, you know, but it like people yeah. just ignore it. Like, Oh, I'm free. I'm doing this or that or whatever. I'm part of this big movement. And it's just like, well, there's government ties to all this burning man stuff. It's like, wh like, what do you what do you expect? This, this is this is my big question, right? Okay, so we'll look at this in two ways. With the Burning Man people, with all the things that they have been doing for 25, 30 years at Burning Man, and with all the things people say, like transcendent experiences they've had, and all the things they participated in and learned up there, why are those people not creating off grid communities? Why are those people not interested in free energy technology? Like the the festival seems to me like it would be a lot easier to do if they had cold fusion than having to track generators out there into the desert, mm -hmm. right? Why aren't they, like, why aren't they, why haven't they figured out uh, how to, de uh, up there they live with a gift economy. They've taken money fully out of the equation. Why aren't those people back here trying to figure out bartering, bartering systems and creating, like, you know, uh, doing shit with what they learn there? They're, they basically, they just accept the world is the way that it, like, you hear them talk and they say, Burning Man is my home, and the rest of the year I have to live away from my home, and then for one week I get to go back home. <laughs> Instead of taking the thing that, like, that they've learned there and trying to change the world, they're just like, okay, well, I get to be free for a week. Okay, they're free on government land, whatever. It's ridiculous. And then, the, that, that, see, that should be the healthy connection between technology and dance music and all this stuff. It's like, oh, let's, let's experiment with free energy. Let's experiment with you know, like technological hydroponic ways to like, you know, grow food. We could grow food in the desert if we experimented with that, right? Like they're not doing that though, mm -hmm. because they're focused on this other shit. And then with the underground party scene, people who've been through like the rave scene and, you know, it's not always easy to pull off an underground party here without it getting busted. Although I do think sometimes that there's help from the cop, you know what I mean? Like I do think that there's, I think that they let, they let some of these go on for particular reasons that we've already kind of talked about. But you'd think that people who are experienced at like, do, having like a secret, secret underground network that, which is what a lot of underground parties and raves, you know, are based on that we, they also would have figured out how to like have gray and black markets where they're able to exchange goods outside of the general financial system to avoid being taxed and feed and whatever on them that they would, you know, have figured out like, you know, 
all sorts of interesting ways of like, you know, basically challenging authority, right? Like living outside of the system, none of that shit. Mm-hmm. None of that. Shit. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's hard because you're like, you see these patterns a lot and you're not trying to stereotype everybody who goes to these events, but you see it happen enough and it's just frustrating. And, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, I, I, I've been a musician and I've been very frustrated with a lot of musicians in the community who like, you, you'll try to talk to them about some of these things and they, they don't want to hear it. And they're completely on board with like official stories on things. I'm just like, w- w- where is this so-called rebellion that like music, yep. you know what I mean? And then the, um the other thing that kind of drives me nuts is that uh there's this, um, people might question certain things, but nobody ever questions science. (laughs) Science is like off the table a lot of the times. And that's, what's so interesting about what, at least what I found out during my research is how much occultism is interwoven into science. And sometimes the doctrines are exactly the same, but these esoteric teachings have been around for supposedly thousands of years. And we're just finding out these things in science. Like the, the big bang story parallels pretty much the story of creation and Kabbalah. Like what's up with that, you know? And so it, it's yeah. like, it, but well, science is like the other, that that's what gives you the technology. So like to me, the science is like the, the other God, the other yep. side of the coin of this technology God with all of this stuff. Totally. I'd say one of the things I find the most disturbing about like a lot of the people I observe here in the underground scene in Los Angeles is that their God is Elon Musk. I can't tell you how many, <laughs> <laughs> SpaceX, uh, SpaceX sweat hoodies and T-shirts I see at parties, and like there's one guy who is part of the crew that throws some of the parties I really like the most. That actually their crew is called Droid Behavior, so it's like hilarious, right? Like, haha. Like I, I think they were doing it tongue in cheek, but I don't think they actually understand that, it, that they're feeding into some level of this transhumanist agenda. Their music is amazing, and they work really hard and they do great stuff. But sometimes I, you know, it's funny to me. But he was having like posts about like the rocket launch of the SpaceX. And I was like kind of making fun of it and I, he didn't get it. He was like, he was like saying, yeah, patience, dear patience. Well, maybe that's get for there. the best. <laughs> right. And I was just like, I felt like, should I get into it and explain to him how this whole thing is like complete and utter nonsense? I was like, no, I just don't have the, you know what I mean? Like if he's that, like if he's that stoked by it and that energized by it and whatever, like I, I just, I don't like, I, I just don't, I don't know how much more time I have for people who aren't questioning anything at all. Yeah, you know what I mean? definitely. Yeah. And that uh, we'll, uh, we're will we running low on time, but I wanted to get to this uh, thing about the the mass or collective conscious uh, that, you know, I, in, in a cult doctrine, there seems to be something very important about, it, um, you know, they call it like the universal will or the collective consciousness or whatever. And I think that this ties into a lot of what we've been talking about, um, especially, you know, music is one of those things that, you know, taps into that. And that's why it's so important for the controlling system to have their hands all over Hollywood and, and have their hands all over all of these, you know, festivals. And obviously this, this type of music that we've been talking about, but um, I, I kind of stumbled across a lot of this with my JFK assassination uh, research. And it's this idea that um, like there, there's two signs that are kind of associated with this in a sense, like cancer is one of them, you know, the water sign and Pisces, another water sign. And so, Cancer to me is sort of like the mass consciousness of our realm and it's represented by the chariot card. And this is why this ties into the JFK assassination with the king and the chariot. It's kind of like JFK, the king of Camelot in the limousine, the modern day chariot. And that's sort of like this ritual that happened to steer the mass consciousness or the universal will. And it's just very strange how you constantly see these things trying to connect to this uh this oneness that's more like to me like the the pisces nature that's like the the realm outside of uh you know material structure and time and whatnot so it's sort of like i relate it to the waters above and the waters below that they talk about in like genesis or whatever if you want to yeah give a basic uh you know mythology to it but um it's just interesting because like the we're talking about you know space and stuff like that um the the moon landing was something that was you know, all tied into this to me in my research. And that to me was like the culmination of this assassination ritual. It's like death and resurrection of the king. And then they send the Apollo king phallic rocket to the virgin moon and impregnate it with this mystery religion doctrine. And all of a sudden we get, you know, 
uh, Carl Sagan doing this whole gift of Apollo thing that what we got to see was the world without borders and this oneness and like, right. and it's kind of like what you describe with people in this, th- this enamorment with like SpaceX or even like in this music scene, they got to get that look on their face that you're like, this isn't really who I know anymore. It's like this glazed over, like dreamlike state on them. I'm like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And that's how like, people get that. Uh, you talked to him about the moon landing, especially my father's generation. Like they just get that look, you know, it's just like their head is in that Piscean state of like, Whoa, this is so cool. And you're just like, Oh my God. Like they've done such a good number on programming us with that. So my question is, what is sort of your relationship to th- what you kind of would deem to be this realm of like this, this uh, undercurrent of collective consciousness how do you think, uh, what do you think it is? Do you think there's some sort of battle going on for it? Like, what's going on with all that stuff? So, wow. So, <laughs> so I know there's a lot to take in. No, but it... <laughs> no that's great. I, I, I love your perspective on shit stuff. And me and Randy, we, you know, we both talk about the waters above and the waters below and space likely being water and that the way that you access, if there is a space out there, the way you access that is by going in. What Your your body's mostly made of, made of water and, you know, like the whatever access to the other worlds is likely through what you know going depths of the ocean kind of thing Mm -hmm. um so i'm totally with you like on that kind of stuff and yeah i think there is this push to create for oneness to create you know unity is the nice way to put it but what it really is about is is about a hive mind and people not being able to think for themselves and um for some reason like i had a few moments early on in my like dance music life where like I could feel the energy and being swept up in that. But I also am just kind of a weird person and who never really fit in almost anywhere I went. And I think in some ways that's been my saving grace with all of this. Um, But I can still feel it. Like I, you can feel something without going, entering into it. So I feel it and I intentionally, you know, on a certain, I kind of, I set up firewalls for myself. Like I'm definitely a person who's spiritual and has a metaphysical life. And, um, you know, so it's funny what you mentioned, um, I am a cancer and my moon is in Pisces. Um, and so I do think that probably the way they would have preferred it to go with me is if I had, you know, kind of fallen into this in the way that they had set out. And I spoke as an ambassador for all of this stuff as opposed to being a little not against it but speaking the truth about it the way I'm sitting here doing with you you know what I mean like I think that like I went rogue on the program a little bit um but yeah I you know I I don't like to create like a metal armor suit because I think it's important not to close ourselves off from experiences so like when I sort of set up my energetic firewall I try and make it like a mesh kind of thing so like I feel stuff but like i don't give myself over to it completely like i'm like you know it's kind of like a feel. net in the water you kind of like, feel it starting yeah. to tighten <laughs> like a net like a net like uh, you know like it's kind of like i want to uh, there's beauty and amazing things to be experienced and so i want to like i constantly am sort of like looking to balance like seeing the beauty with seeing the truth because there's a lot of that available i mean i have used what was probably intended to completely like brainwash me or get me lost in some nonsense. I've used that same thing to become very discerning into, I mean, when I go to parties, I'll dance for hours and hours and I am conducting complete and total inner examination of myself. I'm observing what's going on. You know what I mean? Like I use it as a chance to um, really connect with who I am on the inside and that's the power that it has. And so um, I think, you know, and this is sounds so cliche in some ways, but it's really about the level of awareness. And I think that like, yeah, I don't like what I'm not interested in a oneness that involves any kind of hive mind or collective consciousness that is not, um, respectful of individual boundaries. Um, I like, you know, I'm an anarchist. I like the idea of a borderless world, but not the kind of borderless world that they're trying to create where it's like everybody just is, you know, you can go anywhere, but you're completely controlled by the government and we have universal government. And I know, like, I think people are all here on earth. We should be able to go wherever we want, but we can't expect other people to pay for it when we get there. And you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I'm, I'm really not interested in any kind of, 
I, I don't have much trust or belief or any interest in authority at all. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, I, I'm very, um, conscious on both like an outer level, but also just on an inner intuitive level of anything that's trying to get me swept up in it. And not that I've never like fallen for it. It's happened, but you know, that's an exercise in improving your discernment for next time. Yeah. And it's good because you recognize patterns that led you into it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I, you know, I don't, I think I've gotten pretty good at not being susceptible to it in like the crowd, like in the party situation or out in the massive situation, but it's taken me longer to develop that uh, ability to firewall like in a more one-on-one -on -one individual situation. And, you know, especially those of us who've been somewhat isolated throughout their life, you're looking to have connections with people. And, um, but, you know, there's a level of conscious consciousness that should just be your own and shouldn't be blended with somebody else. And that's been something that I've had to learn over time and I've made some mistakes. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, I think we're really lucky to have our own minds and we shouldn't be so anxious to give it away just to be part of something. Yeah, exactly. And that that's the problem is because I think, you know, everybody deep down wants to be part of something and they want to be, they want to fit into a group and a community, like, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that's the thing that gets manipulated and it's really unfortunate. And that's why I like, you know, the astrological categorization of these things, because it's sort of like, I can kind of put some sort of words to what I feel when I'm in these environments or that when I, when I found like, Oh, you know what? I was kind of buying into some bullshit before. How did I, but I, I felt this kind of like, it's like this weird haze or dream like yep. state that pulls you away from the logic or the, the material world observations of it. And so I recognize that a lot better now than I used to. And so when I feel that, I'm, you know, you, you, you train your mind to kick in and be like, let me observe some stuff here before I yeah. go in. And I mean, it sounds like you're uh, pretty much, uh, you know, same kind of experience. Yeah. We don't want to, I mean, it's really important to be able to like dream and have imagination and all that kind of stuff and think creatively and have some sense of wonder. But we also have to balance that with like being logical and realistic and relying on our past experiences to let us know what something likely means. And like, I'm not like, I'm still like, I have some, you guys, I mean, you listen to the show. I say some crazy things. I have really interesting thoughts and a big imagination, but I, it's, you know, I try to make sure that it's mine and I balance that with love of logic, love of philosophy. You know what I mean? Like things that I like, I actually, even though I say a lot of crazy stuff, I actually really like things that make sense. You know what I mean? I like puzzles and putting them together and I like when things connect and, and are work out. I'm not, you know, like I don't like hazy. I, Hey, like, you know, there's a difference between like creative and imaginative and hazy. And yeah, you know what I mean? Like I, I think if you balance, I think clarity is important and, um, you know, we need imagination and all that stuff, but it needs to be balanced with, you know, logic and clear thinking. Yeah, for that. sure. And then there's like a polarity to that in a way where there's like the overabundance of, of fear and anxiety that leads people into a lot of the same things, but in a kind of completely opposite way. You know, it's like if you're disillusioned in this dream world where you think everything's magical and awesome, but you're being manipulated. That's one version of it. And then there's that like fear porn version where you can't think or do anything rationally because you're in that state of fear. And that's what they do to me. They play off of these things. They give you that fear yeah. to bring you into that empty oneness. And that's like just this good cop, bad cop thing that's always going on. Totally. And you have to discern it's like it's weird because it's always the same words, the same concepts. Things might sound nice, and and you agree with certain things, but there's just something intuitively off. And I think that that it's like you said, balancing your intuition with taking all you can in logic wise, and then you're just like, okay, I've gotten all the information that my mind can handle. Now I got to make an intuitive decision about it because at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to know everything, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, I totally agree. Anyway, so we're running out of time here, but to wrap up, I was just wondering um, if you have any like, you know, tips for people or what do you do to separate the quote unquote agenda in music from your own enjoyment of it? Um, a lot of people will just be like, all this music satanic, they program it with frequencies, you listen to it and something bad's happening to you, run away. You know what I mean? Like there's that camp yeah. of it. And then there's people who kind of find a way to still extract what they want out of it. So how do you deal with that process? So 
for me, like, yeah, you're absolutely right. A lot of people are just like, okay, I found out this is bad. I'm cutting it out of my life. For me, that's not an option because quite literally in some of my darkest days, music and dancing has saved my life. I don't know if I would be here talking to you if I, you know, if I didn't have that to sort of help me through some really hard times. And to me, it has also like helped me to filter through and for me, like a lot of times I'll do like a lot of research. I'll go to a party, I'll dance, I'll think about what I researched, I'll figure out a filtration system for what's true and what's not. By the end of the night, I'm clear on something. It, the, this music, is this like, all music, like it, it's, it's, it's actually just music and sa- sound and frequencies. And, you know, just like they're trying to warp it and do something with it and set intentions into it, like if you're aware of that, you know, like we're just like we can be programmed, we can also be masters of deprogramming. And, you know, also sometimes like exposing yourself to something that is odd or otherworldly and maybe not with best intentions, like you have to have that experience to sort of understand it and become aware of it and to be able to recognize it when it's coming in an even bigger and scarier and more, you know, dangerous form. And so I don't stay away from the music, but I'll say this, like you need to, um, you know, we're, we're here to experience all sorts of things, right? Like this, what the fuck we're in this, like weird, what the fuck is this? Right. Like, <laughs> Like, you know, like there's all sorts of tastes and flat flavors and sounds and sights and smells and whatever. And I'm more of like the kind of person that says engage it rather than hide from it because eventually you're going to have to anyway. Like, you know what I mean? Like you can go hide out in a bunker in the woods and whatever and stay away. But like eventually you're going to have to face up to all that this world is. And so we should practice that in our daily life. And if you love something, but you recognize there's some issues with it, like be really aware of it. I encourage people to balance their spiritual and intellectual evolution with their enjoyment. So, you know, don't just be partying every weekend. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, like spend as much time like educating yourself and becoming an autodidact as you do like losing yourself in the music. Um, And there's a way to have, you know, just you need to know yourself, like really take a chance to get to know yourself. And if you are into some of these high energy, you know, very overwhelming, stimulative kind of experiences with music as I am, like check with yourself before you go into it and then check with yourself when you leave and monitor what, what like your thoughts are, you know, like, sure, it's an expansive experience and you shouldn't close yourself off to that. But like, if you, you know, your own sort of parameters and your own sort of like way of thinking about things. And if you find that like something has shifted and there isn't really a good explanation for it, explore that as opposed to just being like, okay, well, like, you know, just accepting it. And, um, you know, I'd say that and I'd, you know, so also just kind of like debrief yourself, clean yourself when you come out of those, you know, clean, uh, develop a process for sort of guarding yourself energetically and then cleaning yourself energetically when you've come out of one of these like exhilarating kinds of experiences. Um, you know, I think that's really important. And I had something else I was going to say, and it just completely like left my mind. Oh, and the other thing is, is like, you know, um, I really admire Mark for what he's done. And people like him and Dave McGowan have been huge inspirations for me. And a lot of people might think that like we're throwing our music under the bus and whatever. And that's exactly the opposite. We love our music more than the people who are saying we're throwing it under the bus. Like if you really love something, you need to confront the truth about it. Like, you know, like that you can, that goes for your relationships with people and unhealthy situations and whatnot. And like, we deserve to have the magical experience that music music is. And I love the name of Mark's book, musical truth, because he's telling the truth about music. But there's also this other thing, which is that there is a truth that can only be gotten to through music. Like your moments of knowing yourself and like feeling yourself in your most personal, like deep way can happen with music. And so these experiences are important and don't let the scary monsters like scare you off. Like, you know, like stand your ground with them. And, um, we're, we're more than anything, like we don't know what's going to happen when we leave here. So we're here to enjoy ourselves. So if there's something you enjoy, you know, just holistically understand it and, you know, take care of yourself and, um, take care of the people that you enjoy, you know, these experiences with. And that's pretty much it. But I don't think hiding from it is, the, a good or healthy thing to do. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, I have, I was going to say some stuff, but I think you just pretty much summed it up there. So, um, I, before we wrap it up, just, uh, you want to let, uh, the audience know what your where to find you and, and links and things like that. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I'll put so, them in the description. So thank you. No so you um, you can find me at um, offplanetradio.com. Um, we you know our, we do our podcast. It's up there, or you can watch it on YouTube at Off Planet Media. Um, we have a bunch of new things that we're kind of expanding into this year. So look out for those. Um, you can support us at patreon.com slash offplanetmedia. And also um, for those people who are in the Los Angeles area, I have an, uh, an event coming up. Um, I'm hosting an evening of musical truth featuring Mark Devlin nice. at the Mystic Journey Bookstore um, on March Wednesday, March 14th. It's in Venice, so at 6.30 p.m. Um, so if you can join us, that would be awesome. And that's it. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, no, this is really fun. And uh, yeah, maybe we can do it again sometime. Uh, thank you very much, Emily, for coming on. And we'll talk to you soon. Absolutely.